Good morning, everyone. Oh, it's very loud. Good morning. Um, thank you for joining us here today, both to our in-person and online audience. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Emma Selinger, and I'm the Ventures Manager at the Resolution Foundation. So I've been working on everything we're going to talk about today for the past two and a half years with the team here. Um, I'm really pleased to be welcoming you to our first ever Work Tech conference. Um, but before we dig into the sessions that we're going to have today, I'm going to let my colleagues Gavin and Louise do a little bit of introduction into why we're here um, and what we're going to be talking about. So, Gavin, over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Gavin Kelly, Chair of the Resolution Foundation, if you don't need me. Is this echoing for you? It is a bit stronger. I might have to shout about it. If it's really echoey, can you wave at me and I'll just get rid of it. Um, so I just wanted to say welcome to all of you. It's, it's fantastic to see so many familiar faces uh, that we've worked with over the last few years. Um, and I thought I would just say a couple of things really. One is just to uh, kind of talk a bit about why we're in this game. Why are we in the business of social investment and backing innovation. Um, and you know, I say that because people, possibly people here are familiar with the Resolution Foundation more widely and what we do. We focus on living standards, we focus on low pay, and we do lots of analysis um, to try and put those issues on the agenda. And our traditional method, if you like, our method of change, um, not to put too fine a point on it, would be to to bludgeon, uh, if you like, the public, the public debate, and not least those uh, those in power, uh, through a kind of river of analysis, timely, credible analysis um, on all sorts of econ economic issues of the day. Uh, in fact, I think I, I think I can say this is the first ever Resolution Foundation event in 17 years, which is not going to feature a big slide deck analytical presentation. Um, so this is a different method uh, to normal, this sort of this strand of work we're going to be talking about today. And, and the lack of the PowerPoint is both sort of uh, highly liberating and uh, slightly unnerving all at the same time. Um, and the reason why we are, are taking this different approach and having an extra sort of arm to our work to that that we've traditionally done is that our mission is not just to describe and analyse the society and the economy that we that we all live in, it is to change it for the better. And that sounds pious and easy to say, and everyone says things like that, uh, but it really is. And our strap line that we kind of often use is from analysis to action. Uh, there's an equal weight on both of those words. Um, and, and that's hard to get right, but we do that in part, you know, we set the real living wage, we do the calculation behind that, that 14,000 or so employees pay. And obviously we advocate, like lots of organizations, we advocate uh, in, in the policy political arena uh, on all sorts of issues. But a few years back, we decided that that didn't suffice, that we needed a gear change um, and that we needed to get more directly, more actively involved in backing organizations that we thought could make a difference in the world of work, particularly focused on the uh, low wage, insecure, precarious work, but broadly improving the world of work. Um, and so we started in a very small scale, tentative way backing um, some social entrepreneurs who are promising ideas in that sort of space. And you're going to hear, in fact, I think you're going to hear from three of the people that we've backed uh, during the course of today, and you'll hear about many others. Um, now, that work, which is different to the traditional Resolution Foundation work, is, I think, has required both a degree of ambition and a degree of humility to sort of take it forward. It definitely requires ambition because it's really, really hard. It turns out that trying to change in real life, uh, working... <laughs> working practices, working uh, the quality of work through bringing on organizations uh, that sort of see things differently, have got a new, a new idea for how to improve the plight of workers is seriously hard. It's much harder than writing clever policy documents or doing fancy analysis, even though they're very important and you should all, uh, you should all follow the work that we do in that space. Um, and it requires a different set of skills. It requires coalition building. It requires uh, taking risk, embracing uncertainty. Um, it requires an acceptance you'll get some things wrong. Uh, and it requires a lot of resolve to stay the course. Uh, and to do all those things, you have to be ambitious. At the same time, you have to be humble 
you have to be humble in part because the problems you're trying to get at are really, really big and we're quite small. And the organizations we're, we're investing in start off quite small. Some of them have, it's been heartening to see growing quite a bit, but uh, they all start off quite small. But you also have to have humility because there are lots of other people out there. There are trade unions, there are social investors, there are other foundations all doing great work. And the last thing the world needs is someone coming along and sort of pretending that they don't exist and, and replicating. So you need to find out how you add value in, in, in a landscape. Uh, and so we have been trying to do both of those things. We're trying to be ambitious about the work we're doing and we're trying to be have a degree of humility about how we work with others and how we add value in this space. So that's one bit of context. Another bit of context is really trying to understand how this arm of our work on social innovation, social investment to improve the world of work fits with our wider policy agenda, because it's not an accident we're doing these two things in, under the same roof. Um, it's quite deliberate. And in our view, they are absolutely and explicitly complementary to each other. One doesn't replace the other. And to make that kind of more concrete, um, the biggest thing the Resolution Foundation has been doing for the last two and a half years, which uh, I've definitely got more grey hairs than I did even about six months ago because of it. It's been writing a, a major report, which we're going to publish on the 4th of December on the future of the British economy and how to make it grow and how to make it grow more equitably over the next decade and beyond. It's a 2030 inquiry and we're going to launch it with Keir Starmer uh, and a very senior government minister who I'm not allowed to name, but I am allowed to say they're very senior. Uh, um, uh, and you should, if you're not coming along, you should sign up and come along. Now, I mention that because that piece of work will set out a stall on all sorts of things, basically how we think we need to change the British economic model, which needs a lot of change. And within that, there will be a whole raft of stuff on the future of the minimum wage, uh, changes to employment law, investment in workplace skills, creating new sexual institutions to deal with low quality work in particular problem sectors, and so on and so on and so on. There is major policy change being laid out, which won't happen in one month, one year, or even one parliament, much of it. It's a long-term agenda for building a different type of economy. Uh, today's conversation and all of our social investment work in this space sits alongside that. It's part of that. It's not at odds with it. They kind of, they work together of a synergy between the policy and the social investment. And having Having done 25 years or so of public policy work and I guess five years of social investment work, I'm clearer than, than ever that these two things are both needed. You, you shouldn't just have one without the other, but you definitely need large scale policy change that given the structural problems we face in this country, we can't just rely however brilliant on it, innovation and social investment alone, but we do need it too. So before I hand over to Louise, who's gonna give you the re real detail on what we've been doing, the real context to it, I just wanted to do the important thing of saying, finally, a couple of words of thanks. First and foremost to our partners, many, I think all of whom are represented here today. Um, and right from the start of our work in this space, it's been really clear to us that there are other foundations, civil society organizations who had a broadly similar view of the, of the world, of problems in the world of work, but a broadly similar commitment to do something about it that have worked with us and um, they've, they've provided some funding, but really genuinely equal to that, they've provided lots of support ideas, um, amplification of what we're doing and as of what they're doing. And it's been fantastic to work with them. So thank you to Joseph Brown Free Foundation, Trust for London, UFI Vocational Tech Trust, Friends Provident Foundation and Accenture uh, for everything they've done. So that's the first thing. Second thing is beyond those immediate partners, there's a much wider community of people who, again, many of them here today, um, from other foundations, from trade unions, from training organizations who we've, we've drawn on hugely uh, for expertise, for mentoring, for advice, for challenge. Um, and we wouldn't have been able to make the progress we've made without that pool of goodwill. So thank you to all of you. And I definitely want to say a very personal thanks to Louise Marston, who you're about to hear from, who's our director of ventures, who's led all this work and definitely deserves all the credit, as along with side Emma, who you just briefly heard from, who basically are the Ventures team, and they do a huge amount of fantastic work uh, on the Resolution Foundation's behalf. And not least Tara Goatley, who's here somewhere, who's ahead of events, who's, this event wouldn't have happened without Tara's genius. So thank you to all of you. Um, most importantly, today is partly about us sort of telling you stuff we've done, which we're kind of interested in telling you about, listening other organizations who've been involved with us speak about what they've done as part of this program. So partly it's sharing that. Much more important than that is us finding and building alliances for the next wave of this work, which we're going to undertake. So we want, don't just listen, speak up, engage with us, ask questions, get involved. Thank you.
Thank you everyone for joining us today. It's a real joy to bring together this network. So many of these discussions we've had over the last three years of running this partnership have been online. And it's such a joy to see so many people in person here today and to, to build connections between this network. One of the main things we hope you get out of the day is the ability to meet people, to make connections, to find other people with common interests. We're gonna facilitate that partly through just having breaks and having uh, coffee outside, but also through a couple of discussion sessions um, upstairs. So when we get to those uh, sessions, we'll give you instructions what to do, but we really want you to bring your ideas, your opinions uh, and into those sessions and we will facilitate discussions to get as many voices as possible uh, heard today. If you're in the room or if you're on slide online, you can use Slido and the hashtag WorkerTech to put forward questions, to put forward ideas, to put into those discussion sessions and to kind of have a bit of discussion of, of what you think of what's going on. We don't just, as Gavin said, want to talk at you today. We really want as much conversation as possible. Um, I should also say that if you need any help at any point, all of the RF team are wearing yellow lanyards so that you can find us and you can uh, um, ask for help. And if you are extroverted out at any point, there's a quiet room upstairs as well where you can hide yourself away. So we've been on a journey that Gavin's described over the last three years, building this partnership and building this network. Um, when it started, there were relatively few organizations and institutions who were focused on the potential of technology and its opportunities for low paid workers. There were starting to be organizations like Coworker in the United States demonstrating that you can build networks and connections between workers with technology. And there were obviously really big organizations like LinkedIn and Glassdoor who were demonstrating that you could build huge networks of workers, but mainly focused on those in knowledge work and those on higher earnings. So we felt that there was a gap to be filled. We felt there was an opportunity if we could find amazing impact entrepreneurs with a real purpose to what they were doing, who wanted to build sustainable models in this space. I'm really pleased that we found and backed 13 companies, many of whom are here today um, in the course of this journey to, to build that. Gavin's alluded to some of the scale of the problem here and, and how it fits into our broader research work at the foundation. We think there are 10 million workers in the UK who are on low pay or in precarious work with volatile incomes. Good work is really fundamental to our living standards, to our finances, and to our mental and physical health. It matters to all sorts of different aspects of our lives. And too many low paid workers are missing out on the really basic attributes of dignity, respect, and security that higher earners take for granted. We know from the research that, that we do and from reports like Low Pay Britain, which we publish every year, that the bottom fifth of earners are twice as likely as the top fifth to have little or no autonomy in the jobs that they do. We know that the bottom fifth are four times as likely to say they have volatility in their hours and their pay. And we also know that over the last 30 years, job satisfaction for those workers has declined by 16 percentage points. It used to be a premium if you're a low paid worker, at least you got a more satisfactory job, you enjoyed it more. That premium has disappeared alongside all of these other changes, some of which have been amplified and facilitated by technology. And we've heard through some of the qualitative research that the inquiry has done over the last three years, that we've heard from workers who just have to compromise on their earnings to get the flexibility they need to look after their kids or their parents. We've heard from workers who just don't believe that better is possible, that there's no point in taking a risk on a new job because everybody is as bad as each other. And we know that so many workers are really failed by the enforcement system. Shockingly, a third of workers who are paid at or around the wage floor are underpaid the minimum wage. So even where we do have policy and regulation that tries to put in place standards, that enforcement system isn't always getting to those folks. So we know that social investment isn't the whole piece of the puzzle, but neither is policy. There are so many different pieces of the good work landscape and people who want to improve work, and lots of those voices are here today. We know the amazing work that the Living Wage Foundation do in improving standards and, and raising people up, especially with uh, new campaigns like the Living Hours campaign. We know that unions are doing amazing work, um, helping put in place protections for workers, particularly around these emerging changes in the workplace and technology. But we think innovation has a really important role to play as well. We know technology can make things worse. It can also mitigate the worst effects of uh, low paid jobs, but it can also make things better. It can provide new opportunities and routes. 
We think about that in terms of giving people more information, giving people more connections, and setting up different types of organizations. So we're going to hear from a bunch of the ventures today on the panels, but there was not enough panels in the room in the day for enough panels to have everybody speak. So we will hear from all of them, hopefully, in the discussion sessions. Better information. Break Room, who you'll hear from on the first panel, are providing hourly paid workers with better information on what they do. Valor are helping people navigate a really difficult employment grievance system with their templates and guidance. Building connections between people. Organize is a huge network of workers campaigning for better work. And Mobilize is a venture we back that helps support unpaid carers in their caring role so that they can thrive at work and beyond. We can also look at how you connect people to opportunities, help navigate the jobs that are out there and find the best ones. Slinger and Tasker are both networks that provide people with labor platforms to get into hospitality and to trades work. And Early Bird provides voice recognition and AI tools to help onboard people into employability support, making the most of that augmentation that technology can provide by helping people make the most efficient use of technology and complement it with real human support. And then we can change the nature of the organization of work as well. You'll hear this afternoon from Emma from Equal Care Co-op, who was set up as a cooperative to supply care work, giving a better choice and better power to care workers as well as better care delivery. So we can try and achieve lots of impact directly through the ventures. We have published today our impact report on the Worker Tech Partnership, and we reckon that around 130,000 UK workers have been reached and impacted by the ventures in our portfolio so far. And we know that there's much, much more to come. So it's a, it's a small portfolio right now, but it's growing. And there are so many other people that we can reach. So to give you a sense of the shape of the day, we've got a couple of panels this morning to dig into some of these questions. Then we'll have discussion groups upstairs where we can hear lots of different voices. After lunch, then we're going to focus on worker power and worker choice with another panel and then a discussion session following up from that. Because of the nature of the panels, there will, might be some room for questions, but a lot of the discussion and the questions sessions will really be happening in those discussion sessions upstairs. So please make connections today, share your ideas, tell us what we're doing wrong, what we could do better, what we can do more of, how to make more of the potential of this field. I'd like to now introduce the chair for our first panel, Sarah O'Connor is a journalist at the Financial Times, an author of a column which is essential reading for the Ventures team and most of the Resolution Foundation. Um, I'd like to invite her to join the stage and then um, welcome her panel. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, yeah, I'm Sarah O'Connor from the FT. It's uh, a real delight to be here. Um, I'm actually on book leave at the minute. I'm not writing my column, which I'm sure you've noticed, <laughs> um, because I'm writing a book, and actually the book is about work and technological change. Um, and the way I'm envisaging it is it will be about sort of two thirds dystopian and one third sort of hopeful. <laughs> uh, so I'm really delighted to be here to gather some ideas for the for the hopeful final third of my book on the selfish level. Um, I should have turned that on. There we go. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome the panelists for this first panel. So um, we have Sherry Kutu, who is the chair of WorkFinder, Anna Maybank, the founder and CEO of Breakroom, just referred to, Stephen Mears, uh, the CEO of Big Society Capital, and Andrew Pakes, who is the deputy general secretary of Prospect. Would you all like to come and join me? Doesn't matter. Hi. Excellent. Welcome, everyone. So we've got 45 minutes. I'm not going to waste time on trying to introduce these um, very uh, professional people because they can do it themselves. So I suggest that um, we'll take each of you in turn. And if you want to um, introduce yourself, tell us a bit about who you are, what you do, and give us some opening thoughts on what you think are the kind of the key opportunities to use technology for making work better. Um, should we start over here with you, Stephen? Great, thank you. So 
Microphone working all right? Yes. Sorry. Okay. Well, um, wave or shout if it, if it goes wrong. So thank you very much for the introduction and thank you, Resolution, for the invitation. Very, very pleased to be here today. Uh, I'm Stephen Muir's CEO of Big Society Capital, which is a leading social investor in the UK. Uh, and it's also uh, relevant here that I wear another hat as chair of the Friends Provident Foundation, which is one of the other partners in this program. We've been uh, very pleased to work with Resolution over the last few years. Um, I'm going to try and give a bit of sort of context around uh, the wider field of in investing for impact, particularly in innovation and venture. I think um, others on the panel and in the room are much more expert than me on the specific cases that are showing real progress and are really exciting. So I'm going to try and instead paint a little bit of a wider picture and you'll get some more uh, specifics and grit from many of, many of the others here. Um, so our overall mission at Big Society Capital is to increase the amount of capital that's invested in tackling social challenges in the UK. And we have various uh, approaches we have for doing that, but a, a crucial one, the crucial sort of pillar in our strategy is impact venture. And that's so investing in funds that are then backing uh, potential high growth, high impact organizations. And the work tech field is sort of one part of that where we see um, a great deal of potential. And looking at that impact venture system, um, we're very excited about where that is at the moment. And the, the UK is definitely a sort of leading hub for some of that um, movement. Um, a way of illustrating that is uh, earlier this year, we launched a community called Impact VC, which essentially is for um, venture investors of all types who are serious about creating more social impact from what they do. Um, we, we found that here it's got a Europe-wide Europe reach, but the, the, the vast majority are in the UK. And we, in the first few weeks, we got hundreds and hundreds of people literally uh, joining that, far more than we expected. And the level of momentum and interest uh, over the last period has been really, really very impressive. Uh, and this is all about um, our wider strategy of trying to sort of bend the venture system in that ecosystem more towards impact to show how, it, how taking social impact seriously can be a viable, sustainable and successful investment strategy commercially, while also delivering real scalable change through the kinds of organizations you're going to hear a lot about later on today. Um, but we're seeing in lots of fields, with WorkTech being just one example among others, um, real momentum in this sort, sort of area. And I think some of the themes of successful impact venture sort of change that we're, we're seeing in different areas of policy or different areas of social progress, which all, I think, apply in different ways to what we're going to talk about today, I'm just going to um, illuminate. So, one thing we're seeing is where there's been uh, impressive sort of technological innovation in a particular broad field, people then in a sort of almost a second wave using that for greater social impact. Saying, okay, there's companies that are doing something differently. How can we take that insight, that different way of operating and apply it in a way that is much more beneficial to those on low incomes, those who've traditionally been excluded and so on? A um, big example, there's lots of this going on is in the sort of fintech space. You'll all know there's you know, lots and lots of challenger banks, fintech functions, all these a sort of huge wave of innovation there. But what we're now seeing is uh, people taking what's been learned from that process and applying it specifically to the challenge of providing financial services to people who've traditionally been excluded. So haven't been able to get insurance, haven't been able to get bank accounts, haven't been able to get affordable credit and so on. Um, so that's just an, an example of that sort of taking something that's been been sort of tested in the broader market, if you like, and then applying it with an impact lens. I, I think um, we're going to talk later about education and skills. And I think that there is a really big opportunity there in this space. Of, um, there's been loads and loads of ed tech innovation going on for a while. How can more of the learning from that uh, be applied into the particular group of people and the particular challenges facing uh, um, certain industries, certain worker sectors and so on that we're going to talk about. I think you'll hear examples of people who are already doing that and progressing it um, today. Um, I think another sort of theme that we see in lots of the impact venture work we do is around sort of recutting information differently and providing it to different people, which then changes power relationships, changes options, increases choice, and increases yeah, the power that different people have. And again, you're going to hear lots of examples of that in the work tech space, but that's been going on more broadly across other fields of impact that we see, and I think is really, really exciting. And I say definitely very critical in this, this field. And, and a final point, which is perhaps slightly um, off the side of some of what we're going to talk about, but I think is, is relevant take, when you think about the impact we're trying to create. Um, there's also an increasing large desire for mainstream institutional investors to take more account of the impact that they're having when they invest in a whole range of companies and actually workers' rights, treating workers fairly, 
it is increasingly important to large asset holders and wealth holders. And so I think there's something in here about what information can be provided, presented, uh, rankings, um, exposing bad practices and so on. But using tech as a way of actually informing uh, the, the holders of a lot of large institutional stakes in all sorts of companies and using that to put pressure on to increase uh, the uh, well-being or way that uh, improve the way that workers are treated. That's a slightly different uh, take, but again, in other fields, particularly in the climate field, you see a lot of that going on. Uh, I wonder if a future wave of that might be in the work tech space as well. So I'll pause there and hand over to the rest of the panel. Brilliant, Stephen. Thank you. Um, right, let's move on to Anna. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Breakroom. Um, very proud to be one of the uh, uh, resolution uh, ventures portfolio um, and great to kind of pull together um, everyone here today and, and hear a bit of the kind of bigger picture, whereas my day to day at the moment is a lot of talking to employers. So <laughs> it's nice to kind of zoom out and think about what we're trying to achieve. Um, so at Breakroom, we're a platform that helps um, lower paid frontline workers find better quality jobs. Um, the way that we, I'm sorry, is that, am I really echoey and unbearable? It's all okay. Okay. Um, the way that we do that is to help um, workers compare their jobs by taking a 30 question quiz that covers all the important aspects of um, frontline work. So pay, hours, flexibility. Um, we use that data to rate their jobs and help um, recommend better places for them to work. So since we launched in uh, 2020, um, more than 700,000 um, UK workers have used Breakroom to compare their jobs and we rate publicly uh, more than 5,000 UK employers. So shorthand, Louise was talking about this earlier, we're a little bit like Glassdoor, but focused on um, lower paid um, hourly workers. Um, we then work with employers to help them improve their jobs and recruit better quality candidates. Um, I guess my, my take on um, what the future of work looks like and um, how uh, technology can, can help improve that is obviously all about how we use the kind of data that we're collecting and, and publicly publishing to uh, do some of the things that Stephen was just talking about and, and shed a light on um, what it's really like to work in uh, lower paid roles and then to use that data to help um, uh, applicants and uh, workers uh, make change in, in their own jobs, but also help employers change. Um, I think, uh, you know, some of the, we've, we've now collected a very large amount of information directly from workers, which I, I think is, is unique because typically, you know, if you're, if you're collecting ESG data, that's coming from um, a, a kind of top down within a company. And what we've done is create a mechanism for collecting data bottom up. Um, I Sadly, I think a lot of what Louise was talking about um, earlier is definitely reflected in the experience of um, frontline work. So more than 70% of people who've taken the break room quiz say that they think that head office has no idea what's going on on the front line, which is concerning. Um, more than 50% of people say that they find it hard to change their shifts at the last minute. Uh, more than 30% of people say that they're doing work that they're not paid for. So I think our, our data collected from workers really unfortunately reflects a lot of what um, Louise was talking about earlier. I think there is, you know, we are starting to leverage that information to get in front of employers, which is incredibly exciting. So, you know, we started with this mission of helping turn every job into a good one. And we started by collecting and building that mechanism for, for collecting that information. Um, and now we are working with um, an increasingly large number of employers who want to monitor their break room profile, who want to recruit with us. Um, and so we're starting to see you know, the beginnings of getting in front of employers and having serious conversations about, you know, this is how you're, you're rated, this is how you compare to other people. We're providing them with information that they, they don't have um, and they can't get from their own workforce. Um, so I think there's the beginnings there of using data to, to shine a light on, um, uh, on what working conditions look like uh, that's both beneficial to workers and to employers. The other thing that I'm starting to see is the scale of opportunity for operational change within um, businesses and employers themselves. So a lot of our data is actually un showing 
operational problems within a business that are, is ultimately bad for workers, but also bad for companies. And I do think companies recognize that, but they often don't know what to do about it. And I think, again, the opportunity there for technology is, is making some of those operational um, changes. You know, shift patterns is a, a, the, the most obvious example where uh, more than 50% of people not only find it hard to, to change their shifts, but they're only getting their rotor a week in advance. That should be a solved problem and because we have the technology to make that easier. Um, but the reason it's not is often because of the, some of the operational challenges that businesses and employers have and some of the underinvestment in um, sort of uh, improving that operational efficiency and productivity within a business. So I think there's both some opportunities there and also some, some challenges that we're, we're starting to see from, from working directly with employers. Thanks, Anna. That's fascinating. It reminds me, there was a very interesting study done in the US by some academics um, on Gap. You might have read it. Um, yeah. They were looking into Gap had this kind of just-in-time scheduling software and the, the kind of terrible effect that it had on workers' lives. And they piloted in some Gap stores um, predictable scheduling, you know, with sort of four weeks' notice. And obviously, not only did the workers benefit and enjoy their jobs more and there was lower staff turnover, but the, the quality of the stores improved, you know, and actually revenue in those stores increased. And it makes you think, well, why did chief executives not already sort of know about this? And it, it turned out that um, it wasn't that they were sort of burying their heads in the sand or um, that they were just determined to wait, make their workers miserable. What the researchers realized was that every time a kind of board level or senior exec went to visit a store, the store knew a couple of days in advance. So they just scheduled extra people in. So that by the time the senior people arrived, the stores looked perfect, gleaming. And so if you were running Gap, you would think there's no problem at all here. You know, our, our scheduling system is very efficient and cost-effective and the stores always look beautiful. So yeah, kind of shows why getting this ground level information from workers is um, could be really useful from a kind of commercial perspective as well. Um, great, right, let's move on to Sherry. Thank you. Um, so, thank you. <laughs> very good, very good. Service here. Um, hello, Can, is it all echoey and horrible as well? No, I got thumbs up, okay, great, thanks. Um, so I'm Sherry um, and uh, I'm here with my superpower hat on, which is a renamed work finder. Uh, we changed the name because people weren't looking for work, but they felt they had superpowers. Um, and um, the story with superpower actually started with a grant from UFI. Um, and they gave a grant to a charity called Founders for Schools to help um, people on their transition to work. Um, and it's very much a platform. It's a platform that serves um, skill seekers. We're very much about skills first um, rather than academic based. And it also serves employers who are trying to recruit additional people to their team, but also upskill people to their, uh, to their team. Um, and it absolutely uses tech. My, um, my background before this was in helping companies like LinkedIn um, go from zero to 500 million and, and helping them structure their databases with tech so that you could see the skills that people had so you could help them, uh, them being the people, grow their, grow their skills. Um, and it was when I was working within the sort of school sector that we thought there's a much better way of doing this recruiting and up, upskilling. Um, as an investor, I like to do investments in important things. And I've been an impact investor for 25 years. Um, and I wish everybody were impact investors because it clearly would make the world a much better place. So um, in terms of the things that we're doing at, um, at Superpower, we've integrated um, most of the databases that are available um, and their taxonomies. And um, we have a recommendation engine, Web2, one um, that serves people who are thinking about changing their roles and it serves them recommendations of other roles that they could think about. It 
um, serves them courses that help them be better at their role. And that is again, using databases of career, career trajectories. Um, it uh, recommends mentors to them that are in their target, uh, their target area. And it also recommends master classes so they can get comfortable with the place where they um, might want to be later. Um, for the uh, workers themselves, and, and all of this is AI and ML, probably a little bit more ML than AI and not very much uh, gen, uh, gen AI. Um, uh, for the skill seekers, it's improving their skills um, by about 30x over 18 months. Um, we're helping um, uh, women, like one of our case studies is a, a young woman called Notion, um, who we are tracking 2,200 skills that she has on her profile, which means that when she applies to th things, um, we can um, help that employer understand her very well. If the employer rejects her, um, we give her a diagnostic of who the, re who the employer did not reject, and we recommend courses that she can take that are free that allow her to um, improve her skills. Um, it, in the industry at the moment, this industry is so broken. It's just shocking. On average, uh, apparently it takes 300 applications of a young person to get a role. Um, on ours three years ago, again, if you come and you're not super tagged, then it takes about 60 um, different applications to get a role. 80% of employers left to their own devices ghost uh, young people who apply, which is fundamentally wrong and yes, should be known. Um, and we set about wanting to stop that. So the employer who posts a role with us has 72 hours um, before they get a notice from us saying, do you have any idea the catastrophic effects of you ghosting someone who has applied to you has on that person? Um, and um, they're given a notification and 24 hours to respond. If they don't, then we take that applicant away from them. And we inform the applicant that they should go to a different employer um, and that some of the things they can do to improve their skills. We have bias alerts for the employers um, sometime, who need a lot of help. I had no idea how much help employers needed when we started this out. Um, but um, we let them know if there's a bias um, on gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic, or disability that we detect in their behaviors or in their role descriptions. And we advise them on what they need to do to improve it so that um, they, their behavior and their content no longer contains that bias. Um, very much humans in the loop. If they have neglected to put compensation in, which means no sane person is going to apply. Um, we let them know that if they actually want to be successful and fill that role, they'll put in compensation and we query all of the databases that there are and we let them know how much compensation they should pay because sometimes they don't know. So we give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, it is so easy to see the really important and e you know good things that you can use tech for in this industry to help not only people who are seeking to upskill themselves and get themselves out of a, a position that they feel uncomfortable with, but also to help employers fill those roles. There's a million open roles in the UK. If we filled those open roles, the uh, benefit to our GDP would be about 40 billion pounds per annum. Um, the cost of youth unemployment is about seven billion pounds per annum. And the cost of just open jobs uh, is again, another six, seven billion pounds per annum. So it's not just damaging young people's lives. It's also impairing our ability and our competitive advantage. So I love what you guys are doing. Thank you for doing it. Uh, and I think it's really important, but um, it's not just a thing about the young people, the recruiters and the employers themselves need some help. And the best thing in the world is to use tech and AI to help them do the things that they want to do. 
don't know. Thank you. <clears throat> That's great, Sherry. Thank you. The FT did a big survey of young people a couple of years ago and um it was like a qualitative survey so people just wrote i thought they'd write maybe a couple of hundred words people wrote long essays about um what they were worried about and how they kind of felt their lives were going and it was really striking to me how many young people talked about the kind of brutality and sort of really sort of dehumanizing um feeling of trying to apply for a job particularly when you're young and yeah just feeling that there's no one there's no one on the other end of that transaction I mean what an awful way to enter the world of work so I think there might not be humans on the other end well of many, right many of those platforms exactly which is, Increase, um, which is increasingly wrong. so but going yeah. down to two uh you know two applications to get a role is where we are with the use of AI at the moment mm. um and it'd be nice if you could get it further down but that's that's what has been achieved already and gives me reasons to be hopeful about our futures great stuff thank you um Andrew Good morning, everyone. So I think I'm here for, I think, two reasons. One is to be a representative of one of the oldest pieces of the puzzle for this good, better work agenda, which is uh, the great trade union movement of, our, of ours. And secondly, I'm a tech optimist, and sometimes I try and reconcile these two competing things around what's happening. Um, but I, I feel really privileged to be in this room. Uh, I come from a, a social justice and a work background. Uh, and too much of this whole debate around technology, AI at the moment, looks at the issue around trouble. But in, in my learning and starting point, there's a, some of you may be aware, a great US civil rights activist called John Lewis, who coined the phrase good trouble. So I, I feel very privileged to be in a room of people who are committed to the cause of good trouble uh, and making tech work for us rather than us work for the tech itself. So look, there's a couple of things I will talk about from that vantage point around trade unions and where do we fit into this. Uh, and I think this, this ecology of making work better needs to involve all of us in the solutions. Uh, I think speaking to your, you know, the previous point, what Sherry said about an industry that's broken, I think for too many people in Britain today and around the world, the economy full stop is broken. And if we want to address some of these bigger challenges we all face around anxiety, around loneliness, around agency, around trust, the way to do that is to start by solving the issue around how people fit into the world of work and what work means to them. Uh, and too often, this big debate we have, whether it's, you know, robots are coming for our jobs, whether it's about the huge economic change and tectonic plates that are they're going to shift in the economy, much of which can largely be true. People hardly ever fit into that conversation. And that's the bit that really worries me. You know, when you looked at the government's AI safety summit, representatives of civic society and worker organizations were largely silent and absent. When you look at the government's AI strategy, which looks at tech and the economy as a whole, it is typically focused on the, in a bad way, I think your way was good, in this bad way of superheroes, that there's only a small number of people who will have the skills and the ability to succeed and code and create the future, that by implication, the rest of us are secondary to that or second fiddle to that process. And I think anything which creates a discussion or debate which makes us feel othered or separate from our future is going to create a discord that we already see within our society. And to me, that's the real power. So how do we use and harness our good trouble to do that? So there's three challenges that we would look at, I think, to try and resolve from this with your help in terms of the future of work. And I say this from a union that uh, represent, we represent around 160,000 people, primarily in the private sector, but also government specialists, lots of people working in tech itself. So we have a growing tech workers branch of around two to 3,000 people in places like Spotify, Twitter, and others. We work with some of our international sibling unions because we know some of this big tech is transnational and our responses as a movement need to be transnational as well. And it's brilliant to see so many trade unions being into get into this space and I will embarrass completely now by making a shout out to John Wood uh, who is in a room. John can you give us a wave? Brilliant. John is here from the Trade Union Congress and leads their digital lab. I would encourage you to ignore me and speak to him for large parts of the day because John has a brilliant overview of how the international and domestic union movement are doing that. So what are my three challenges? My three challenges are people, place and power. And if we're, unless we can use technology to address those, we're going to fail to succeed in our quest to make good or better work for the majority of people in this country. So what do I mean by that? 
people is what I'm going to talk about. Technology needs to be about the prism of people and how it adds to our human endeavor. And too often, government strategies, business strategies are around technology being implemented because of the bottom line or because investor capital has seen different ways of doing work. It's about saving costs. It's about driving shareholder value. It's about moonshots for society when governments are looking for distractions from their wider economic performance and its impact on the rest of us. What it isn't about is how it adds to human well-being. It isn't about the kind of worth we have. Around about two-thirds of our 2033 workforce are already in work. And how much time do we spend in that balance of debate between investing in schools, which is critically important, to come out with an adult skills solution, which addresses most of us? Now, I've travelled here this morning from one of Britain's lowest paid cities where warehousing, call centres and logistics dominates our private sector employment. We know in three to five years, half of jobs in call centres will be gone because AI and technology will make a better service, better service, but us as customers. If you regard that as a technology discussion, it makes perfect sense. Improve something for your customer base, use the technology, save money and create a virtue. If you stop there and don't include the workforce, what happens to those half of jobs in a low skilled or low paid economy and how we get that? And that in itself, to me, tells a really easy story about if you don't involve people in your narrative or your stories that you're constructing and you make sure that we are outside of that conversation with no concerns about our impact, we shouldn't expect any other outcome than people being distrustful or anxious about the way brilliant technology could play in helping them because they've only experienced it as being something bad to them in terms of what's happened. Second challenge is about place. The brilliance of our technology means that we can work from just about anywhere but actually jobs have to be done somewhere and the big fear is that we will end up like we've done in previous forms of economic change where old industries have died in some places and capital itself has been the sole derivative of where that new industry comes from because actually we need jobs in cities like mine we need jobs in the northeast in the midlands and elsewhere and the ability of technology to allow the economy to happen anywhere negates from an experience of where it happens to happen somewhere. So there has to be a place-based policy approach to this to understand how it helps youngsters get opportunities and then and their older generations to get pride and place out of the work they do. And finally, it's about power. I'm from a union. It's always about power. Who makes the choice? Who gets to edit where the data lives and how it's used? And how do those things come about? And actually, I think the things that some of the most brilliant, wonderful examples that Resolution Ventures has helped support and many in this room is about letting that sun shine in. It is about co-production and co-value, the cooperatives and mutuals in this room, the mutual experiences, the kind of examples we already heard are about trying to give people a sense of dignity or pride about the choices available to them. And unless we address that in a way that government policy currently fails to do, we're going to set ourselves up for failure in terms of how those policies uh, get about. And we see that every day in our work, and John will do it for other unions here as well. We've seen, even in some of the most tech driven things. We represent workers in Twitter who were on Christmas Eve last year digitally locked out from their workspaces. So when we talk about people being able to work from home and have all the flexibility we want, it also means they can be turned off by their employer at a moment's notice. What is that physical connection that happens to them? When we represent workers at the likes of Spotify who work across multiple countries, what means that workers in this country have power and have dignity here to be able to work with their colleagues and derive futures that make for them? When companies decide to invest in AI and new technology, how are we sure that it's adding to our well-being and dignity as opposed to just deriving value elsewhere in it? And what has frightens me most is that we are walking down a pathway where technology is done by the giants and those who have power, not people who are excluded from power. But what excites me most in this space is the kind of work you're all doing in this room alongside unions, alongside mutuals, alongside others to try and redefine what this future is. I was saying to someone at the very beginning, and I'll, I'll end there on this point, which is we have spent so long playing catch up in terms of the impacts of what's happening. And I'm really pleased this talks about better work rather than future work, because the future work is already here. So this is about how do we make work outcomes better for people for us? We've got to get ahead of it. 
because actually better work isn't just an end in itself, though it is important as an end. It is part of the process that defines how we build a better, more connected, more inclusive, democratic society for all of us. Because if we have that respect at work, that ability to earn and learn and share with our families and our communities, all of us benefit, including the businesses investing. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, that did feel like a round of applause moment, didn't it? R rousing. Um, so you've made the you've made the case there for why we might want an awful lot of investors' money to be flowing into technology that makes work better, gives workers more information, more sort of power that sort of tilts those scales a bit. So let's kind of discuss a bit how how to make that happen and what are the kind of barriers to making that happen. I'm, I'm really curious to learn more about the, the kind of the, the social investment space. And um, I mean, maybe you two actually, um, Sherry could, could speak to this. What needs to happen to enable a lot more capital to kind of flow into ideas like this? Because clearly, you know, if you're a company like Deliveroo or Amazon, you have no problem in raising vast amounts of capital um, in order to deploy technology, which arguably makes the quality of work worse for lots of people. So what, what needs to happen or what is happening or, what, or what's not happening? What are the barriers to kind of facilitating a rush of, of money into this space? Um, very, very briefly, and then I'll hand over to others. I think um, what we're trying to encourage and, and we are seeing some signs of is it's almost a mindset shift actually and um i still get at you know events or conversation people saying oh aren't you always having to make a trade-off between your financial returns and your social impact and that's fine for some investors and it's fine for you a big side of capital but if we're running a pension fund we can't accept any trade-off because we've got a duty to maximize returns to pensioners many of whom in, you know, are quite low income sales and so on and so on um, and you know, in some cases that is true, but when you actually look across a, a, a range of areas, be it work tech, but also beyond, actually it isn't a simple trade-off and frequently impact is actually a source of value. And the commercial success of many organizations is tied into their ability to create impact. And that's definitely the example on the panel here. If, if, uh, if you're going to reach more people, deliver more value for them, more, more benefit for the workers, that's how the company will itself succeed. And there are a whole load of areas where it is not a trade-off. There is a correlation. Uh, and as long as um, the organization that's being invested in, the, the organization is, is staying true to its its impact mission, that it can also be aligned with commercial value. So the sort of uh, the, the, um, the mindset shift that's needed is looking for where, where is it that those things can come together? What pools of capital are impact interested in impact and there are more and more and more of those whether that's foundation endowments or yeah certain pension funds or wealthy families individuals there's lot, lots more people who wish to generate positive impact from their money and there are definitely more examples appearing of where impact is also a source of commercial value you can bring some of that together it's not the case everywhere this is not a sort of panacea there are areas where there are genuine trade-offs and choices but equally there's bits where the two can can go together and if i look at our portfolio a lot of the impact stars the organizations that are achieving outsized impact for large numbers of people are also financially pretty successful in one way or another. Great. Um, Anna, tell us about the, the pursuit of commercial success as well as impact. How easy is that? Um, uh, you know, I don't actually think about it that frequently because it's just so obvious. Um, but Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. But I, I mean, what Stephen's just said is that that's not always, uh, you know, there's a, we've got this bridge to uh, cross in terms of that becoming obvious to the, lots of people into the mainstream. Um, so maybe I'm the worst person to ask. I, I, in terms of sort of how to get more people thinking in the way that the Resolution Foundation has been trying to think, if you look at the kind of traditional VC industry, really it's a fashion industry, right? So, like, at the moment, what's in fashion is AI, whatever that means, <laughs> right? There was a point where Deliveroo earned a lot of money because what was in fashion was the gig economy. Like, when I first started my career, this is going to sound really old now, the thing that was in fashion was something called Web 2.0. <laughs> and, like, basically, you just pitch the same thing and put a different moniker in front of it. And, like, I think the other thing is that those trends tend to be, you know, the 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 old school 
trend at VC has also been whose problems are we solving? We're solving the problems of people who can build stuff. Oh, that tends to be young white men who are, have traditionally been engineers, right? And so I'm not sure I have a full kind of answer to like how we solve this, but I think it's partly about you know what's interesting about what the Resolution Foundation have, have done here is to say, okay, we're going to try and solve problems for people who aren't from that community and we're going to pick a theme and we're going to try and explain why that theme is matters and why there's a big opportunity there and I think that's that's very contrary to how the traditional VC industry works how you get more kind of LPs invested in that and thinking about that I think I'll see them um but yeah those are some of the kind of my experience of of pitching in this industry has been Great, thank you. And Sherry, you've been doing impact investing for 25 years. Do you have any thoughts on how to kind of suck more money into this, this sector? Uh, well, how about attract more money into this <laughs> sector? Um, I was also on the Impact Investing Commission um, that was looking in, into this. Um, one of the, th at the moment, there are mechanisms in the public realm. So I'm a chair of the remuneration committee at uh, Pearson, and we are asked by our institutional investors to prove that we do good things. And we've built it into our bonus and also our long-term incentive plan. But that's just public companies, which is not the vast majority of companies. So for private, I think um, private equity is probably a bit difficult, but I know that there's been an accord, but I think holding them to account would be helpful. For VCs, um, really heartening to hear what, what you said earlier about the impact in um, investing. Um, if we could get the pensions, um, it, there's a, a, a move to bring money from the pensions that invest everywhere but here and in everything but our private companies. Um, if they could, if one of the things that made them um, uh, more easily invest in here was that it brought about the circular economy and made the world uh, a, a better place, that would be brilliant. So I think that the pensions being released could be massive. An impact that they could have uh, on is if you tied it to it being impactful at a societal level, uh, that would be brilliant. Um, I like, as a, you know, as a director of a large company, I like being held to account and I like being asked, um, are you sure that you're doing things that make the world a greener place or a S, you know, we're usually more S. Um, and I think we need to be clear about how we're doing that, how we build it into our products and how we live it, how we um, structure an increase in the development and the coaching of staff who were from disadvantaged backgrounds. I think we can do that as employers and um, we should, celebrate the employers that do that and the investors that ask for that as as well so you know, at a systemic level we procure from you a government could say i'm not going to have this contract with you unless you do that they should um as a creator of companies i want them to do that because i don't want the bad guys to win who have flaky um corporate governance structures and who don't take good responsibility with AI and their tech, I don't want them to win and they shouldn't win. And we control it. We buy it, we invest in it. So if you buy it or you invest in it, you are in control. So I would I would ask all of us to think about what we can do. Good stuff. Um, this is quite a short panel. It's only four to five minutes. We've only got five left. So I think let's... Um... If you had any questions, I think you need to save them for the for the discussions that will be coming up, um, or indeed for a later a later panel. Um, I think let's just have a kind of a slight broadening out to a to a big picture because I'm conscious the rest of the day will also be quite focused on the details. I mean, Andrew, you talked about this sense that actually a lot of people are kind of fearful and mistrustful about technology and about how it might change their prospects for getting work and the quality of their work in the future. Um, I was in Sweden recently for a reporting trip, actually for the, the book that I'm working on. Um, and everyone that I mentioned this to kind of looked at me blankly and they were like, really? No, we we love tech here. You know, bring it on, more robots. Yes, please. Like, let's do it. And I thought it was really striking that actually, you know, there are 
there is a potentially kind of different future in which we feel much more optimistic about technology and, and what what kind of underlying conditions need to exist in order to make that possible, whether that's about having a sense that you have a voice in the workplace and how this thing is implemented, or whether it's just that you trust that your safety net is sufficient to kind of hold you through a period of disruption. So I wonder if each of you have like one big picture thought on what needs to change, maybe outside of the of the kind of technology space itself, but you know, a, a kind of big thought about what 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 kind of country or, or policy needs to be different to help us navigate this with more confidence. Andrew, do you want to start? Sarah knows that saying Sweden is like catnip to me in, in terms of the economy, because it, it, so, uh, we do a lot of work with our Swedish sibling unions. And what struck me on probably about six or seven years ago in one of my early trips to the Swedish movement was they've got this great phrase, actually the, the Swedish prime minister used to say it, Ed Miliband used it for a while as well, so it's come over, I'm not the only one who said it, which is that uh, workers should not fear the new machines, they should fear the old ones. And it strikes me as a really interesting thing about the whole psychology of Sweden, who know as a small country, the only way they can afford the high level of social benefit and welfare that they share as a national characteristic is to export more and sell more because they're a small country. To export more and sell more, they need to innovate because they always need to be ahead of the game because they're not a big trading block. The only way they innovate is by investing in their people so that their workforce as a whole can deliver that innovation. And then by doing that, they then create the value throughout their companies, not just high level, to sell more, to pay more taxes. And through paying more taxes, they have a better quality of life than us. So is that virtual win-win? And I see this completely as a win-win. If we can solve together, so my big plea is always, we often approach this as a question about technology, when really at a bigger level, we're talking about change management or human relations. The technology is a vehicle. And we've seen two, three really good examples already on the panel in, the, in this room that when people wish to, we can use technology to create liberation, dignity, and respect for people in ways they've never experienced before. The power of this technology is greater than anything we've seen before in many ways. So it can solve problems if it has human endeavor. So my great plea is let's make this about social partnership. The win-win is that workers and business and innovators together, we can control our future if we choose it. Thanks, Andrew. Sherry? I completely agree with what you're saying. I think it's fantastic. Um, so I, I wrote down mindset um, and um, I've, been amazed at how capable we are as humans of reconfiguring ourselves. Um, that could be called upskilling, it could be called learning. Um, we used to think that learning stopped once you were finished university or you were finished school, um, but our, we continue to accelerate our learning throughout our lives and that's getting harder. So um, I think for me, um, invest in the reconfiguration of adults skills and um experience so that they don't fear um the the machines um and you know the old machines and the old way of doing things will stop and they will it will stop at an accelerating pace but our ability as humans to adapt ourselves is infinite so let's think about empowering people to um, understand the mindset that that is the case and that they control it and they control the pace that they can learn um, and make sure that employers who could be thought of as an educational institution in itself, that they, um, they, bear, they bear in mind that they need to invest in their people as well. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, wow, well, one, one. Uh, one, right, one big thought. Um, In about 30 seconds. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, I think we've got to continue pushing down this path of showing that there is this huge shared interest in better quality jobs for just both workers and for employers like the the bigger break room grows the more and more that's just clear to me in the data that we collect where there's this huge overlap between you know this is a bad situation for a worker but it's also costing a, a, a business money or they're not making as much money as they could be doing if they changed how they were working and I think the more 
evidence we can show of that, the closer we'll get to proving what Stephen was talking about earlier of like actually impact and, and profit are not, um, uh, they're not working against each other, they're working together. And I think the, you know, the, the more we keep talking about that, the better data we've got about it, the more there is gonna be a slow kind of cultural shift towards that. And I think, you know, people younger than us are gonna see that as, just see that as obvious. And I think, um, I think that's gotta got be where we kind of continue to, to push. Great stuff, thank you. And Stephen, last word to you. Yeah, oh, thank you. Um, I'm going to loop right back to what Gavin was saying, actually, in the intro session about the why why resolution do this work tech ventures work as alongside the like, heavy policy analysis piece. Um, because I think in, in the, we clearly need all sorts of policy changes to drive forward the, the, the agenda we're talking about here. And I think one of the things that what we've talked about on this panel can do is uh, open the open up the window of possibility by showing to, to government, to policy makers, decision makers, actually, there are different ways of doing things. The, these examples exist. Breakthrough exists. Superpower exists. Th th there are models here that you can then design your regulatory frameworks, your policy frameworks uh, to, 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 to point in a different direction. You don't have to just uh, you know, do what's already happening or what the, the you know, three big tech companies in the world tell you you can do. There's actually some other models which you can use as uh, sort of painting the space where policy can operate and expanding uh, the window of policy choices, which then enable the bigger, bigger shifts, which can move the whole dial in, in the right direction. So that, that um, synergy between innovation and policy change, I think is really critical. Wonderful. All right. Well, on that note, I will wrap up this first panel. Thank you so much for listening. Um, please give the panel members a, a round of applause and I will hand over for the next one. Thank you very much for such a brilliant first panel of the day. A lot of food for thought about good work and a great way to set the scene for the rest of the day. Um, in particular, the discussion around the skills needed for the future workforce, which brings us really nicely onto our next panel on improving access to training and skills and how technology um, can be used to facilitate that. So if I could now invite the, the next panel to join me on the stage, um, chaired by Danielle Walker Palmer from Friends Provident Foundation, one of our um, worker tech partners. Uh, unfortunately, Theo um, uh, is unable to join us today due to COVID, um, but everyone else uh, is here. So I'll hand over to Danielle. Hello. Um I'm Danielle Walker Palmore from Friends Provident Foundation. I'm just going to invite you all to stand up and just give it a shake. Come on, let's get a bit of energy going in this room because I know when you're sitting for a long time, it can be a bit much. So anyway, that was it. Don't leave, <laughs> sit down. We're good. Thank you all for uh, your engagement and presence. Um, as I say, I'm Danielle Walker Palmore and I'm from Friends Provident Foundation. You met my chair in the last session and my colleague um, uh, Charlie will be joining us uh, in the afternoon um, in the audience. And Friends Provident Foundation is a supporter of um, the Worker Tech Fund development. Um, and uh, one of the reasons we are um, interested in this work is that as Friends Provident Foundation, our focus is on how we can have an economy which is fair and sustainable. And um, you can imagine that having worker voice, community voice, and also um, addressing some of the issues around information asymmetries and how they operate in the economy is central to actually restructuring the economy. Um, we tend to think of um, restructuring the economy in terms of what we call the four Ds, which is Okay, this is always tricky to make sure I remember them all. Decentralized, democratized, decarbonized, and also we call it diversified, but we actually mean that in a kind of decolonized. So actually addressing some of the structural um, inequities in our economy. And so you can see how in terms of the last discussion um, and hopefully what we're gonna talk about here and when we talk about skills and training, um, it's vital that to get those four Ds operating. Those are, those are conditions, they are not sufficient, but they are a start toward having a fairer economy.
So I will start chatting on and introduce um, the panel. Um, and we have a fantastic panel. And like Sarah, I'm not going to go through and introduce them all. And I'm sorry that we're missing Theo. Um, um, but um, we have um, Helen Gironi, who's uh, another supporter of the Worker Tech uh, Fund um, and uh, uh, activity. And we'll talk a bit, bit more about that. We've got Claudine Ediami, um, who's one of the ventures supported by uh, the Worker Tech Trust. Um, uh, Louise Murphy from Resolution Foundation, who's going to be able to give us a big picture. Um, and me as well. So I will not talk too much, but I will hand over first, I think, to Louise, who can introduce herself and also give us a good sense of the overview of, of what's going on in, in skills and training. Perfect. Morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I'll just speak for, I guess, two or three minutes to introduce myself and set the scene. And then I'm sure as the uh, panel discussion goes on, can delve into some things in a, in a little bit more detail. Um, so I'm an economist at the Resolution Foundation, focusing kind of broadly on labour market employment and also um, skills and, and education. And I thought I'd kind of briefly outline the three lenses through which we've really been thinking about education and, and training over the last couple of years. As Gavin said, we've been doing this big piece of work looking at how we can transform the British economy and we've been clear throughout that, that education and training is a, a vital part of that. So the first thing that I think is important is really thinking about how we can reduce inequality in the UK um, and how we can you know, make it possible that there's good jobs available up and down the country to, to, to people from all backgrounds and we really need to think about how we can improve education and training to, to do that. For example, we know that there's been a decline in the number of apprenticeship starts among young people. Um, that's been a pretty constant trend over the, the past past um, past decade or so. And so we need to think about how we can you know, improve that so that young people that, you know, maybe don't, uh, you know, don't have a sort of educational bent that don't, um, you know, maybe do go that kind of traditional path from GCSE to A level to, to university can can get the skills and training they need to, to find a good career. And then the second lens through which we've been thinking about this is really in terms of growth. I mean, that's something that we're hearing constantly from politicians of all backgrounds, how we can, you know, boost growth, improve the, the British economy. And again, I think it's it's hard to think about that without thinking mm -hmm. about skills and training. You know, we obviously need to invest in transport and things like that, but we also need to make sure that workers really can, can do these high growth uh, jobs. Um, and what we found is if we want to um, boost the parts of the, the economy that the UK does well on, things like life sciences, creative industries, these, these jobs, these careers really require people to have um, yeah, high levels of, of education and training. And then finally, the, the third lens through which we've been thinking about this is really in terms of health. Um, so again, we're hearing a lot at the moment about you know, the growing number of people that are out of the labour market due to to ill health or, or, or disability and we've been thinking particularly about how we can improve the, um, the education and employment prospects of young people who have health conditions and again it's become really clear that skills and training is a, a big part of that a shocking four in five of the young people who aren't working due to ill health don't have a qualification above GCSE level so I think it's really impossible to think about how we can, you know, get Britain working, get people um, into the labour force without thinking about how to make it easier for people to, to get the skills and training that they need. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, can I hand over to Claudine? Sorry, this is unrehearsed. So we're there. it's a surprise when I come people. So um, can I hand over to Cla uh, Claudine to talk a bit about Early Bird? Yeah, sure. Um, good morning, everyone. I am the founder and CEO of Early Bird. Um, Early Bird builds technology for employment support organizations. So organizations that are um, delivering hyper-personalized programs to support people into work or training. Um, we build the technology that helps them to capture a much uh, deeper set of insights and understanding on the participants that they engage with um, through simulated voice-based conversations. Um, for us, really what, why we exist is to support people to thrive in employment. 
um, and we're at the very early stages of the journey of um, them getting into training and, and skills because they're at the point of the, of the journey where they're not really sure uh, maybe kind of the, the pathway that they want to take. They have a number of barriers that are preventing them from accessing work or training, um, which can extend from the uh, typical kind of employability challenges around, you know, not having the right CV or not having the right qualifications, as has been mentioned, right the way through to having challenges um, on a more personal level that can affect their ability to to, to work or, or learn. Um, so those could include things like challenges with their housing, uh, challenges with mental health, personal relationships, and so on. And so our technology um, supports those organizations that are um, helping those people to overcome those barriers by enriching their understanding of those so they can improve the quality of the support they deliver. That was wonderfully succinct. Thank you very much. We'll come back and hear a bit more about it as well. Um, Helen. Can you get the, the input from your perspective? Absolutely. Hi, my name is Helen Gironi and I'm Director of Ventures at UFI Ventures. Um, and we basically uh, support or we invest in uh, technology businesses that are helping uh, adults, so post 16 years, uh, people upskill and find good quality work. Um, We've invested in uh, 16 ventures so far, um, offering uh, a very a diverse range, really, of um, innovation um, in this area. And um, I guess my uh, take on providing greater access to skills is that technology is a, a great enabler. There is There are a lot of uh, great in innovative businesses in this space. Um, so I think there, there has been we've got the technology to provide greater access or greater access to skills um but it is also a very fragmented system and i think uh that means that it's a, a bit of a sort of postcode lottery essentially actually somebody chancing upon technology that is suitable for them um and um that they're you know supported uh to realize that that's the right uh thing for them at that point in their in their journey. Um, so I think a big part of uh, enabling access to this is uh, more intentionality, uh, essentially from uh, FE colleges, from, from schools, from employers to uh, show, showcase and, and show what um, available technology is out there for people um, and to uh, provide people with, with better information really about what's available. Fabulous. Thank you very much. Um, and now we're going to have a little bit more of a panel discussion. Um, and I'm, I wanted to go back, picking up on the theme that came up in um, the introductory sessions, as well as um, the last panel. Really, what is the role of policy in this? Because I think, Louise, you outlined your three lenses, but in some ways, what to, what's the policy role in addition to obviously thinking about the social investment tech um, venture type level, but what's, what's the policy solution? Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely good to think not just about what the, the problems are, but also what we can, what we can do about it. Um, I mean, I think the first thing is just reflecting or thinking, um, uh, properly about you know what's going well and what what needs improvement I mean I think too much of the debate is currently around university whether we've got too many graduates what sort of courses they're doing actually when we look at kind of the the skills demand and supply we, we're doing about right when it comes to you know the the number of people going to to university but where we're doing less well and where there's definitely need for for policy is both on making it easier for young people who um, are less academic to get sort of so-called sub-degree level qualifications, those at level four, level five, what sort of is traditionally seen as HNDs and, and HNCs. The UK does pretty bad compared to most international countries um, in, in providing those qualifications. And so there's certainly a role for policy both in just practically, you know, pr making it easier for, for colleges and universities to, to provide those courses to work with employers so that they're given the recognition that they deserve so that, you know, practically, a, a, you know, a young person feels like that is a good decision for them to, to do one of those courses. I mean, I think at the moment, it's not surprising that few young people take that trajectory when 
you know, most people haven't even heard of these courses. They don't know anyone that's done them. So, you know, how can you convince someone that that's a, a good thing to do? And then I think, secondly, the other real area where, you know, policy could be doing more is to try and, um, you know, reverse this trend we've seen, which is a decline in in-work training. Um, so consistently, we've seen um, fewer workers receive training. And what's particularly concerning is it's the, the lowest educated workers who receive the least training. Um, so they're sort of doubly disadvantaged. And also what we've seen is that the decline um, in recent decades has been most pronounced among younger people. Um, you know, we have some policy in this area, notably the, the apprenticeship levy, which is, I guess, increasingly being used for um, sort of in-work training for existing employees rather than being seen as something to, to, to upskill young people. Um, but I don't think we should see the apprenticeship levy as the only vehicle for providing in-work training. There really should be um, more um, or an easier way for employers to kind of give short-term kind of more gradual training. So we've, for example, proposed some trialing of things like human capital tax credits, um, kind of slightly similar to, to what happen, what currently happens um, for research and, and development, but certainly thinking more about what we can do to incentivize employers to, to upskill their, their workers is um, should be seen as a priority, I think. It's brilliant, it's really helpful. And then looking at it from the other end of the, the, the sort of telescope or the other, the other lens, you know, what is the role of technology? I mean, Sherry gave us a little bit of a sense of how technology can support um, training. But Helen, from what trends have you seen in terms of um, some of the ventures, other ventures you've supported um, in terms of the role of technology in, in ensuring low paid workers in particular can get access to skilling and upskilling and reskilling? Yeah, it's a really interesting point. I think there are a number of uh, ventures in our portfolio that are doing really interesting work here in, in terms of uh, ensuring access. So, for example, uh, Capslock, one of our portfolio companies, it, it's essentially it's a, a boot camp um, in cybersecurity. Um, and their, uh, their intervention, their learning is fully funded. So they provide through a partner affordable funding upfront for the upskilling. Um, and essentially what they're seeing is that the, the graduates post-learning go on to uh, something like double or th there's, there's a significant uplift. There's a, um, you know, tens of thousands of pounds in terms of their salary uplift post-completion so that um, the learning is affordable as long as they can uh, get access to funds pre-learning. Um, so that's a, that's a really interesting way of making sure that it works for both <clears throat> the learner and the uh, provider of the uh, the intervention as well. Um, I think also one of our um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, portfolio companies uh, called Assemble U is uh, providing access to learning for mobile uh, first employees, so people who aren't sat at, at desks, and in fact, eighty percent of the global workforce doesn't use a computer uh, in their working day. And so what they're doing is they're providing bite-sized learning uh, to people through their mobile phones, which means that they can access, you know, 10 minutes of, of learning in the car on the way to work or when they're walking their dog. Um, and they're seeing that this is a really popular way for um, employees who are uh, not, not able to access a computer uh, to learn. And it, and it really is the engagement rate is very high uh, and completion rates are very high. So... I think, you know, really um, making personalizing the learning to to the individual is really important um, and making sure that the, it is fully funded up front and that there's, there's funding available. Thank you. And, and turning to you, Claudine, what are the biggest challenges that startups have in terms of making an impact in this kind of fragmented but also a huge area. I mean, what are the biggest challenges that you've faced setting up a venture in, in this space? Um, good question. So um, I think the one of the key challenges, and I think it's um, quite common for a number of different startups is funding and access to <laughs> Funnily investment. enough, I thought. Um, so thankfully, Resolution Ventures have, have backed <laughs> us and supporting us to do that. But I think that is one of the, the, the big challenges. Um, and then I think it's thinking about what your business model looks like and how you navigate the space. So 
Helen was talking about fully funded programs and things like that, where you typically are looking at um, government schemes um, that are funding these, these, these programs, and then you're kind of having to sit within a particular box for that and thinking about how you can um, penetrate those contracts where some, some of them it's not as easy to um, integrate tech into some of those as well. Um, so I think that's one of the challenges that we've that we've seen and come across. Um, and then um, another point that Helen was talking about was that seeing increased engagement with some of the technology that exists. And I think that's really, really critical. Um, so we've seen that there's been an increase in um, different types of forms of learning that have been fully funded. So for example, um, boot camps from the DfE, um, but we've had reports from loads of providers where the, the engagement levels and dropout rates are really, really high on those types of programs. Um, and so it's really looking at how you can build technology that is really, really user centric and, and user first um, and looking at how um, the engagement rates of, of, the, of the learners are, are high um, to combat some of these challenges. Um, I think the other thing for us is really thinking about what is what is the reason for the challenges that exist today. Um, and for us, a lot of it is around one awareness. So a lot of the people that we come across, they aren't even aware that some of the opportunities to learn um, exist, um, both unemployed and people kind of in work as well. Um, particularly for the people who are in work, there is huge challenges around time. So having um, technology that is really accessible um, is, is really important um, because you have people that have all sorts of other commitments, working long shifts in their jobs and things like that, where they just don't have time to, to commit to traditional courses. Um, and then again, funding. So having those opportunities that are, are fully funded. So I think as a, as a founder, it's kind of looking at what the landscape look, looks, looks like, what the needs are of those learners and, and those individuals who need to access skills and training and how you can marry the two and insert yourself in, into that landscape. That's really helpful. I suppose from a per, uh, where I sit, I sit in a kind of different, not necessarily in this space. So it sounds like we've got both fragmentation and um, compartmentalization. So you get trapped in boxes, like you have to operate in that box, regardless of whether that makes most sense to the problem you're trying to, to solve. Um, and so one of my questions really to all of you is how can this system be more dynamic and responsive to the needs as they develop? Um, so I think I take Andrew's point, you know, the future of work is now. So how do we um, help workers respond to that? Um, but also, yeah, just a feel for how how do we um, deal, how do we create a dynamism in how we provide things um, for or how we create opportunities? I don't know if you have a, a sense of that, Helen. I think it's quite difficult to do on a sort of company by company basis because each company has its own, uh, you know, um, uh, things that are important to them and I think also it, it's quite difficult for companies or it's rare I, I've seen it rarely that a company <clears throat> will put aside a, 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 a substantial amount of resource to, to focus on this area um, for me the obvious solution if it's affordable is for it to um, happen through for example the further education network or in schools at the beginning of people's careers um, but again, that's a resource issue. You know, who who uh, pays for that? That's uh, you know, that's a, a big issue. Perhaps it's you know, employer organisations grouping together. There's a there is a lack of information flow. It seems between further education colleges and schools and employers um, in terms of sort of understanding what the local challenges are, what the local needs of employers are. And, and the, the sort of upskilling and learning that's happening on a local basis. So I think definitely better communication um, and, you know, government funding would be, would be great. <laughs> I think I'd in particular like to see um, the government funding, like test and learn opportunities, whether they're involved or not, but really kind of putting money into um, allowing partners to test and learn technology in, in new environments. Um, and partner up with different types of organizations. I think that would be really cool. And there has been some examples of that in the past in terms of inclusive economy partnership that happened a few years ago and things like that, but I'd love to see more of that. Do you want to talk a bit more about that? Because I'm not sure everyone will know how that works. How do test and learn opportunities work? Well, they don't do it much. <laughs> um, but I think, so with the inclusive economy partnership, um, 
to, to my understanding, I think that's completed now, but we were um, a part of that program um, where they delivered a program called Boost, um, which combined uh, government, civil society and um, startup uh, founders. And the idea was to really kind of bring them on a journey to explore partnerships, um, funding, education, communication between um, those parties. Um, so we use that program to connect with um, government bodies, with potential customers, um, with other founders, um, and also with investors. So it was really kind of bringing that space together. And I think that kind of model um, could exist where you're kind of funding opportunities for um, particular organizations to, for example, collaborate with a further education college and see what they can kind of come up with or partner with an employer and see what they can come up with. I think that would kind of help inspire and motivate more conversation. It's really helpful. And, and Louise, I don't know if in the research, issues of dynamism and how we get some inject some energy into this process yeah I mean definitely echo what's been said before I mean I think there's some movement in this space so for example we are um seeing you know a bit of a commitment to changing the, the sort of the way that loans work to make it easier for people to kind of chunk up their learning do modules rather than having to commit to doing you know a, a full kind of year or multi-year long course and I think you know as we've heard just for many people particularly low paid workers who might be juggling shift work or juggling work with other commitments, you know, that just isn't isn't a viable opportunity. So I do think that is, um, you know, a necessary part of what needs to change. And I do think hopefully technology would would make that easier for people to to fit training and education into everything else that's that's going on in their life. Um, but I do think maybe what's what's still missing or that we need to think about a bit more is just really thinking about skills and education in a strategic way. So not just thinking about where we are now, but thinking where will we be or where do we want to be in say 10 years time. So that includes just thinking about, you know, how we want to grow the economy. How can we make sure that the skills and training opportunities are there for, for people to go into these kind of high growth sectors like, um, you know, like life sciences or like some of the new technologies that the UK is pretty competitive in. But also thinking, for example, about the transition to, to net zero um, and what that might mean for the, the jobs that we're going to be doing and making sure that, you know, for example, some of the, the things that are topical now, you know, do we have enough apprenticeships or training courses for heat pump engineers or electric vehicle mechanics? You know, these should really have been things that we were thinking about 10, 15 years ago rather than, than now. And so I guess as we now think about AI and things like that, we should be trying to, to get ahead of the game. Thank you. Um, a question that I have, and it's something that actually is a holdover from work that Friends Provident used to do a lot more of, which was relating to financial inclusion. And um, one of the things we noticed in this area was that people, um, when talking about financial inclusion, when you talk to corporates quite often about financial inclusion, they were very keen to talk about financial capability which was actually about the skills that people had to manage and navigate the financial system and financial products. Mm. Um, and what began to be sort of echoing in our, in our collective uh, organizational mind was actually these were very much solutions about fixing the people, not fixing the system. And just really wondering if people have like reflections on, you know, are there collective solutions here, which actually start to redress some of the, the challenges around power and how that gets held, but also reflecting some of the points that were made in the previous panel about really employers not knowing how to fix stuff. Like they can see there's a problem, but they actually don't have solutions to hand. And I just really wanted to get any reflections from the panel before we allow you to have your, your break, proper break, we can actually leave the room, um, you know, to do to, to collective solutions, solutions which are about trying to speak and redress some of the power imbalances in the system. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, Claudine, from a venture perspective. Um, in terms of the, are you talking about in terms of the end users? Yeah. Connecting them to each other or? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, to be honest, mm. off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, that's fair, that's fair. I don't know, Helen, you've come across anything in your... Well, not not specifically from a, not a, not a venture, but I think there is, um, to Louise's point about thinking strategically, I think there's a part that um, as, a, as, a, as a country, 
um, we all have to play in helping uh, people who are outside of the workforce think strategically about what uh, skills are, are sought after, for example, green skills, uh, uh, skills in the construction uh, industry, for example. There are pockets of, there are areas in the economy where if they got the right training at the right time, it would be much easier for them to find really good quality work. Um, and I think that information is getting through to companies that are in the, the right position to understand how it works, but there is a there's a problem in, you know, basically people, you and I, understanding where the pockets of demand are. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't know about anybody else on the panel, but when I was thinking about my career, I wasn't thinking strategically. And I think that can make a massive difference to somebody's start in, in their career and, and how the initial years go and, and progress from there. Any thoughts? I don't think it, I think that that sums it up pretty well. But um, I mean, I think just the way that, that we think about this is really, um, you know, in terms of, you know, better access to, to skills and training, allowing people to find, you know, good jobs that have dignity that they feel that they feel proud of. Um, and I mean, I think just there's a, um, you know, I guess a huge prize to be had what we can see is, you know, at every level, just kind of getting, you know, even going from, you know, level two very low level of qualifications up to something like an a-level equivalent results and people you know having higher wages um so i think we shouldn't forget just sort of how transformative this can be and what that can mean for for low-paid workers both in terms of you know money in their pocket but also just a yeah a, a job or a career that they feel proud of brilliant thank you um i want you to hold questions and points you want to make about skills and training um, because I believe the next session is um, after the break, the real break I keep promising you, um, you actually get to go into breakout rooms and have kind of discussions about that and make connections. Um, but I'd like to invite you to thank the panel um, uh, in the, the usual way and then I'll hand over to Louise or Emma. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, another really interesting conversation. Um, and before we head out to the break, I just want to explain quickly what's going to happen in the breakout sessions afterwards. Um, so we're going to ask you to switch from listening mode into talking mode. Um, so we'll be heading upstairs to the second floor and splitting out into two different rooms. The first, uh, which will be which will be a kind of facilitated discussion sessions. The first will be on le learning and training. Unfortunately, Alex isn't here today, but Helen, who you've just heard from, will be uh, facilitating that session. And then the second session will be on careers guidance and employability with our own Louise Marston. So in the break, have a think about which you'd like to attend uh, and have a think about the questions and discussion points you might want to bring up. So yeah, I'll let you go for coffee now. Um, welcome back everyone and welcome to those of you who have just joined us for the day. Um, I hope you enjoyed the breakout sessions before lunch, which were around training and learning. We had some really interesting discussions um, in uh, upstairs, uh, particularly around, I thought the net zero green skills group um, was really interesting. That was the first time we talked about kind of green skills today. Um, so yeah, really, really enjoyed that discussion. Um, so this afternoon, we're going to take a look at work and tech at a, with a slightly different angle, looking at worker power and worker choice. Um, so I'm delighted to hand over to Clara Skrivankova from Trust for London, who is another of our worker tech partners. Um, so Clara, over to you. Thank you, Eva. Oh, that's very loud. Um, I can I can whisper. Um, welcome back after lunch, and we've got the privilege to bring the energy back into the discussion uh, for this afternoon. Um, this panel is going to focus on workers, worker choice, worker voice, and what does the advancement of technology mean for workers? Um, there is loads of opportunities that we can find for workers, but also loads of challenges. We are seeing erosion of rights. We are seeing diffusion and disconnect between individual workers as they become managed by uh, algorithms. And it makes it hard 
to access your rights, to advocate, and to enforce them. And to talk about these challenges, but also touch on opportunities, we have got a great panel of four speakers. Um, I'll ask them each to introduce themselves first before we launch into discussion. And I will start from Kate Dearden. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Um, thank you so much. Really great to be here. I'm Kate Dedham from Community Trade Union, and we're a union representing workers in sectors all across the UK economy, from steel workers, prison officers, teachers, tanker drivers, um, and the way they work in, in a range of ways, from employees, the self-employed and freelance workers, to everything in between. Uh, so a real diverse union sort of representing those workers all across the economy and, and dealing with numerous challenges they face. Uh, so really looking forward to this discussion. Welcome, Kate. Um, and over to Hannah Slaughter from Resolution Foundation. Hi, um, my name is Hannah Slaughter. I work at the Resolution Foundation um, and my work covers lots of different aspects of the labour market, but in particular with a focus on uh, low paid workers, working conditions, enforcement of rights and also kind of worker power and the, the way that that shapes um, people's jobs and their working lives. And on the other side, we have got Emma Back. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Um, I founded Equal Care Co-op five years ago. We are a platform co-op, which is a rare breed of entity, but one which I hope will eventually take over the world. Um, there are lots of us all over the globe. Uh, essentially, that means that we're building a digital product to enable caregiving um, and to promote both worker choice and power, but also the person who's on the receiving end and family members as well. Um, we work to a model of care that where power and choice is kind of built into the DNA. So it's not just about being a co-op. Um, people receiving support build their own team. They choose their workers. The workers choose them. It's a kind of negotiated consent on both sides. And everything that we do is to facilitate and enable that and to help that caregiving relationship be the best it can be. Um, we then organize into circles locally. So we sort of work to a more decentralized model um, where workers are then able to recruit new workers um, to bring on new people who are looking for support. And so to sort of start to open up the way the organization works to, to not have that kind of very, that, that triangle um, that, that is the default for sort of every organization um, everywhere in many ways. Welcome. And then um, we've got Jagar Kakad from the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me. I'm Jagar Kakad. I'm Director of Government Innovation for the Tony Blair Institute. We're a political consultancy operating in 35 countries across the world. Um, my job is to think about how the state needs to uh, adapt for the challenges of the 21st century in particular, how technology is changing the relationship between citizens, governments, and businesses. And right at the heart of that is how technology is reshaping the future of work. Um, to that end, we've done some work on classifying and quantifying atypical work here in the UK, UK including the gig economy, but also looking uh, across uh, different markets and how gig economy and gig workers feel in London, Singapore, Nairobi, and uh, Jakarta. Thank you. Um, so to set the scene for the discussion this afternoon, I'll ask Hannah to give us a bit of a background into the current labor market situation and in particular in the context of enforcement. Thanks, Cara. Um, yeah, so as I said at the beginning, um, a lot of my work um, focuses on kind of broader issues of, of job quality, worker power, and, and kind of at the very sharp end, how that kind of translates into um, breaches of workers' rights. So just to give a bit of a sense of the um, the problem. So from a purely financial perspective, we know that wages are lower than they could be otherwise because employers have power over their workers. Um, academics have estimated that 
wages could be about £100 a week higher if employers didn't have that power over workers um, on average. So that is kind of a big financial kind of consequence of what we're seeing um, from the imbalance of power. We're also seeing um, kind of a, a pr um, quite a prolific um, uh, space of poor quality work. We know that after the financial crisis in particular, there were there was a big rise in insecure contracts, um, things like zero hours contracts, temporary contracts, and that hasn't gone away even as kind of the jobs market has, has recovered after that recession. Um, and then at the very kind of most acute end, we see workers not getting the rights that they're owed in law. Um, so we estimate that around um, 350,000 people are being underpaid the minimum wage, about 900,000 people say they don't get any paid holiday entitlement, and about 1.8 million people say they don't get a pay slip so they can't actually check that they're getting the, the right pay and the right um, the, the things that they're entitled to. So this is kind of a big, a big problem. It's also unequal. It probably won't be that surprising to people in this room that it's um, particularly low paid workers um, who are um, bearing the brunt of these poor working conditions. Um, and also um, other marginalized groups, such as uh, people from migrant backgrounds, people from ethnic minority backgrounds. Um, these, these are kind of um, particularly a key for some groups of workers. So there's kind of a, um, a big problem there. Um, kind of more um, kind of about kind of what's what's going on underneath that, like wh when workers face problems, what, what's kind of happening. Um, it's, it's really difficult, like the way that the labour market institutions are set up for workers to actually assert their rights and argue for better um, better practice, um, you know, aside from kind of the, the well-known decline of kind of formal collective bargaining in the form of unions, um, it's also just become kind of harder for workers to leave their job, you know, it, lots of workers, if they're getting treated badly, their, you know, their natural response would be to, to kind of leave a job, um, but if there's either you don't know what options are out there or if there are no good options out there for you um, or if all the jobs that are out there are equally as bad, then that's just not really an option for you. So that's kind of making life really difficult. The, the kind of state systems that are set up to enforce workers' rights are, are weak and patchy and kind of underfunded. Um, and, and so that's kind of um, a big problem. And then workers um, often struggle to enforce their own rights through an employment tribunal because it's costly, it's really stressful, it's you need to know what you're doing. Um, and so there's kind of a big gap. And, and I suppose... You know, it's, it's there's obviously um, a role here for the government and for policy, and that's what I spend a lot of my time thinking about in my kind of uh, day job. And you know, there's certainly um, a role for the government in strengthening the rights themselves, strengthening enforcement of those rights, um, helping to strengthen labour market institutions, be that trade unions, or we've proposed setting up new kind of sectoral institutions to to get the sector to agree on better. Uh, conditions in sectors um, like social care, like cleaning and like warehousing. Um, but there are also kind of areas where either policy isn't moving quickly enough or where, um, you know, policy, national policy might not kind of be best placed to, to, to kind of help workers, you know, know, know their rights, know what's out there and kind of improve their power in the workplace, which I suspect we'll get on to discussing today. So I think that's probably enough for me. There is a lot in there. Thank you, um, Hannah. Um, I think the, the the impact, the financial impact of the lack of power that you set out at the beginning is 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 quite significant, and I think that's something to really illustrate what it means in financial terms for low paid workers not to have power. Now, you talked a lot about what needs to change in policy and some of the barriers, um, but let's talk about what the employers can do. Um, Maybe I can start with Kate. What, what what can employers do to shift or contribute to shifting the balance of power and give more powers to low paid workers? Thank you very much. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm speaking from a trade union and I think uh, recognizing trade unions and the absolutely incredible work trade unions have done across sectors and working in good partnership with employers has transformed workplaces across the country and sectors. Um, at Community, we like to work in partnership with employers for that purpose. When a business does well, ultimately our members do well. Um, and that's the 
achievements that we've managed to uh, work with employers on, whether it's driving up better pay, introducing transformative policies in the workplace, whether it's around menopause, on mental health, um, on a range of issues that are really transforming the day-to-day -day lives of our members, but also the wider society and communities that they operate in. Um, because, you know, we really feel like trade unionism isn't just confined to the workplace. It's really important for our society and communities too. So obviously, I think the trade union movement is absolutely vital um, in answering that question. Um, and I think for low paid workers in particular, uh, you touched on all the challenges that we are operating. I think that context is is really important um, and how we look at the world of work and today people are, are much more likely to move sectors, careers and combine those different approaches to work um, more than what trade unions were used to. We were um, formed 100 years ago and how different the union is now and the sectors that we make up has really made us think about how we represent our membership and the different approaches we have to take because we are seeing so many workers who are now in those non-traditional roles. So from freelancers and subcontractors to HC and gig workers, and we have seen a lot more low paid work on that side of things. So I think that broader picture outside of the union, not just employers, but um, reflecting that context that we're operating in and that challenge that the nature of work has called into our system, a question the system of workers' rights that you mentioned, um, that has fallen far behind that blended labour market that we see today and that we see in our membership. Um, workers do are taking on sort of those greater risks with less security and protection in exchange for perhaps more flexibility at work. And that raises a whole load of questions around government policy, but also what employers can do better but they aren't employers sometimes that we've worked with in the past. They're on platforms and, you know, there's different relationships there and different ways to navigate it. So I think that raises a whole load of questions around who their employer is. Is there an employer sometimes for these low paid workers? How do we then navigate that bargaining system? And how do unions respond, adapt and reflect on that um, to make sure that we represent the needs of, of the modern worker, worker of today? Emma, um, you described a very different model working um, and uh, what I would almost describe as, as, as a sort of the self-management teal concept of organization um, but that's not something that's not what we are talking about uh, today but what would your suggestion be in terms of what employers can do differently in order to enable more power to be in the hands of workers using your experience and the model that you have set up with your organization feedback um i would expand the term employers just in recognition of of what of what you've said and thinking about platforms um agencies kind of any organization that it is essentially a provider of work um or a a, a an enabler of labor to kind of occur um and to say that any entity that is doing that has a moral obligation to both its customers and to its workers, regardless of whether they are employed, workers, self-employed, whatever other category kind of people want to fit into or are designated. So that's kind of the ground that you have a responsibility if that's the work that you're in, that's work you're doing. Um, uh, the second kind of key component is uh, consent. So whenever you get a job, there is this sort of tacit kind of, right, I've signed the employment contract, I'm working for this, this employer. Um, and for the duration of me working, that's me working in consent, regardless of kind of how they treat you or sort of the levels of exploitation that you might experience. The employer is working off that initial day that you came into the office and signed the contract. Um, and then, you know, then all bets are off. Um, certainly in social care and the other low paid sectors that we're talking about here. Um, so if you look at consent as something that is not day one, and then you can forget about it, but look at it as a concept that is a daily sort of micro interaction kind of thing, um, then you can start to build organizations that are much more collaborative and don't need to take that kind of combative employer versus employee, worker versus provider, you know, gig worker versus platform. And to say, well, we're all building something here. Obviously, cooperatives are a really great format for that, but <laughs> they're not the only one. Um, and 
Uh, and then that also goes for your employment basis. It goes for what you do on a daily basis. It goes for who you work with. And actually, the more that you're able, and this is also where technology can help, to personalize an experience in a job, um, I mean, we we say to people that they can be employed, they can come on self-employed, and there are obviously different implications around that. Um, we ran a bread fund over COVID just to kind of pick up on the on the safety net um, aspect of self-employment as well, but there's still more to do there. Um, and in in terms of the agreement that you're making with somebody when they start work with you, um, if if you're saying things like if you want to whistleblow your position will be protected if you want to raise a grievance or an issue your position will be protected um and actually employment is not usually a protecting factor for that regardless of what the legislation says but if employers if providers of work if agencies are able to make those conscious commitments to say regardless of how you work with us, you will still access these rights. Um, and we, we renew the agreement that we have with you on a daily basis, not just at the beginning of your engagement with us. Um, those could be some, some great steps. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. And Jagar, um, you talked about the work that, that your organization has done specifically around the non-standard types of employment. Um, can you explain a bit more about what that actually means for worker power, but also how can we offer more choice to workers and sort of shift that unbalance of power? Yes. Uh, definitely. So we um, used a new survey in the UK called uh, Understanding Society, or it's an old, long-standing survey of 40,000 households, but they had a new wave of data that uh, allowed us to understand um, a kind of full spectrum of atypical work, everything from your kind of traditional self-employed kind of consultants to uh, gig workers and other agency workers where there's a third party intermediating their access to work to those that have kind of um, more zero hours contracts. And what we found through this is um, basically, as I said, there are three categories of atypical workers, um, what we call uh, hustlers, the traditional self-employed, the giggers, your gig workers, and the impermanence, the people that are very, very precarious in the relationship with work. Um, the first thing to pull out is that um, only about 2% of all People in work over the age of 16 are gig workers, which stands in stark contrast to some of the bigger estimates out there by uh, TUC and others. Um, and I think Res Foundation has found similar levels of gig working. Um, so I think just one to put into context some of the work we're talking about. Um, in terms of their experience of work while they're in work, um, uh, we, we like to say that atypical work is about flexibility. It's about having choice, et cetera. But what we found, it was only really the traditional self-employed that are typically older uh, workers in a second or third phase of their career that had genuine control over their hours. Um, when it came to gig workers, agency workers, or um, those are slightly more kind of on zero hours contracts, they had the same agency over their hours as traditional employees. Um, despite all the rhetoric around flexibility, they had less, they had the same amount of control. The problem we found was that they tended to be paid by the hour or by the task, which made their attachment to work far more precarious, um, and, and that became a problem. They also had different forms of training from their employer or their uh, um, the person in providing them with work. I think, but it's a good distinction. It's a really important distinction that Emma made. We can't we can't just talk about employers because it has a certain context. Um, uh, the other thing we found though that a lot of this work was was traditionally temporary. Um, and, uh, for example, um, uh, gig workers, 43% of them that were gig workers in 2016 were in traditional employment by 2019. So there's a lot of movement between different types of workers. Um, 
in addition, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll, I'll come on to what our recommendations were about how do you give them choice and control. Um, when we did our work across four different cities, Jakarta, London, Singapore, and Nairobi, um, what we found is that workers' sense of control can be undermined uh, by a lack of clarity on how decisions are made around their work, around their hours, or around their pay, um, and their inability to react to influence or control uh, the way in which decisions are made really undermines their, their attachment to work. Um, and I mean, that's not surprising. I think it was actually quite um, satisfying or kind of like, like across the world, just despite different types of labor markets, different types of economies, workers pretty much had the same concerns and the same desires from work. Um, where we've landed is on um, how, do you, how, how do you support workers and worker voice is what we call a minimum set of worker rights across um, digital rights, uh, including transparency over day, transparency over data, uh, portability over data and, and pay, um, minimum set of rights around pay, including access to um, uh, the right to request sick pay, parental leave, even access to pension payments, um, minimum uh, uh, access to self-employed being represented in uh, bargaining units. And I think while we've been here, the Supreme Court has determined that um, delivered Drew drivers cannot be represented by a trade union for collective bargaining rights. Um, if you allow the self-employed to form parts of bargaining units, that would solve that problem and give them a right and a, and a voice. Um, and the last thing is, is right to access um, uh, kind of different different things around health, safety, and well-being, especially for um, people working from home. I think just really specifically on choice, it comes back to data and transparency. Um, the more that platforms in particular can be transparent about um, the, the pay people are getting, paid workers are getting, drivers are getting, um, and the more uh, that that data is portable and comparable across platforms, and I think there's a great um, uh, company here, Rodeo, that's trying to do some of this, um, the more choice and power the individual uh, worker, the individual have, um, because that puts them in the driving seat. And you, you, you can get to a position where platforms um, aren't using, uh, you know, the opaqueness to kind of drive down wages is actually visibility over the different types of wages you can earn at that given point, platforms might have to start to compete. And I think that's where you get uh, worker power and worker choice is through that transparency of data. Great. So we're moving into the discussion around, well, how can technology be an opportunity to enhance worker power? And your example around transparency around data and actually giving workers the data that they otherwise would have in a different type of um, employment relationship um, is, is one of the examples. So what else can we use technology for? What opportunities are there? Either of you. Thank you. Uh, there's so much to cover, so we will get cracking on, uh, particularly on tech, and I can speak to a bit about what we've done at Community um, internally with our members and our reps in terms of giving them the tools they need to sort of bargain around technology. So coming back to that earlier point I mentioned around the role of, of trade unions in this conversation, um, but just take a step back on what we've spoken about in terms of that playoff and um, the, the risks that workers are taking when it comes to security and flexibility and, and how we sort of overhaul um our system of, of workers rights here i think for for us as a union um what's really important in ending that trade-off and instead delivering on a vision that makes new forms of work work for everyone but in a meaningful fair and decent way is really important and part of that is rather than inhibiting innovation we actually make innovation work for everybody in all these different forms and ways of working that we've spoken about um and when it comes to technology actually understanding who the technology is serving and thinking about that before we even approach what legislation, for example, we would want to see um, to make sure we can secure that better work and, and better experiences of work. Um, so for unions, I guess, making the most of technological opportunities, I would break it into, into two parts. Um, workers themselves using it in order to have a better time at work, also how unions are using it. And we've been um, 
sort of seen those ways in which new technology can make jobs better so that more positive side um to the story and more efficient and flexible if it's deployed in the right way and the less demanding physical work and we know that if technology leads to greater productivity and profitability, that does mean more money in our members' pockets. Um, so for us, it's how we then manage those tech changes at work correctly. So we have the opportunity to create positive change for workers. And a lot of our members are, are positive about the opportunities, but they're concerned that they are not being consulted when techno technological changes are introduced in the workplace. Um, so there could be a positive story to tell here when we're in sort of relation to um, employers and, and partners that we work with and, and around technology in the workplace sort of moving towards those shorter hours to the same pay or better work environments and safer workplaces. Um, but it's a huge question around that existing regulation that protects workers from those risks posed by the use of AI um, and algorithms or encourages the development of systems um, that actually support human dignity and making sure that, yes, workers do feel positive about, about this, uh, which I think the earlier panel touched on slightly too. Um, so we have done a bit of work around sort of training with our members and with our reps and a lot of other unions across the space and the, and the TUC too have been doing some work around how unions can change our systems to, to sort of bring our members and reps with us. Um, but we also want to see technology change sort of brought firmly into the scope of collective bargaining um, and recognised as an area in which work consultation is legally required. Um, at the moment, the TUC and lots of other unions are working through a bill of how we can actually make that happen and, and sort of bring it into reality. It looks like we won't get that from the government in a form of an employment bill um, in this parliament, which is obviously a huge missed opportunity. Um, but it's still really important that we start on that work and, and make sure we can shape what it looks like in the workplace. Um, and also with the Institute of Future of Work, which I think Anna is in the audience. Um, <laughs> you are. Yeah, we've been doing some work and sort of more practical things for our members to get stuck into in the meantime. Um, so actually how we can create those tech champions in the workplace and bargain around technology. Uh, so we sort of developed a four stage process for workers um, with the Institute to follow when consulting. So it's sort of identifying that technology um, that may have a significant impact on work and assessing the risks and impacts that technology might have to engage in, in dialogue and, and meaningful consultation, um, which obviously isn't new to, to our reps or to trade unions agreeing an action plan and sort of having that useful framework to aid and understanding and ensuring the aspects of what we currently have in terms of existing law and good practice are adequately captured, um, but ensuring that consultation is genuinely meaningful. And I think that's that's really important for us as part of this conversation of how we use technology and for unions themselves, um, that we are making the most of, of those opportunities. Um, and TUC colleagues is, is in the room, um, that Andrew <laughs> referred to earlier, won't make you put your hand up again. <laughs> But there's loads of uh, good work that has been done by unions to make sure we are doing that. So I would take it sort of, sort of that two-pronged approach from the workers themselves to actually unions and how we're responding. Thank you, Kate. Um, Anna, yeah. Emma. Uh, the majority of technology in the caregiving space is B2B. So it's sold into home care organizations, which means that the user requirements are led by the management and the owners. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so when we started designing, um, we asked the question of each feature, is there a legal reason for us to not be able to do this thing that is usually in the province of the manager? So managers can assign shifts. Managers can determine pay. Managers can choose where you go over the course of the day. Is it illegal to allow the worker to be in control of that? No. So what, why is someone else doing it? Um, and actually, if you kind of look at the features that are built into technologies and particularly permission structures that are built into technologies, um, which, again, are led by business owners, management, people who require oversight, people who need to chase people to do stuff that they're not doing or are doing, or people who need to surveil others in some way, shape, or form, um, then you can start to, uh, I guess, unwind the systems of power that have been ratcheted in to the majority of the technology products that we use in our lives or which we are subject to. Um, the NHS is a 
rich and enduring basket of examples. <laughs> so as long as co-design is also working well with ownership and doesn't just fall back into consultation, as long as you're thinking about who can do what, who can see what, who can change what in this technology thing that is being built, who can define an entity, who can define a relationship, then that, I believe, is the key to beginning to unlock the sorts of power mechanisms that, after all, technology is only there to reproduce in the existing structures that we already have the vast majority of the time. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> um, thank you. That, that was a great analysis of um, how technology is just effectively a mirror of the hierarchical structures of, of an organization that were built a very long time ago that we still seem to subscribe to despite all of these innovations and new ways of working and talk about new ways of working. Actually, we work in the, in the old way through technology. Um, Hannah. Um, yeah, just to um, probably echo lots of what's already been said. I mean, I think that in terms of how tech can kind of help worker power, there are kind of two sides of it and one is on the collective side which Kate has already covered a lot of and I think that that you know the ways that help uh, that tech can help um, workers kind of organize and uh, kind of um, carry out collective bargaining is is all the more important when workplaces are becoming uh, less and less the kind of quote unquote traditional kind of everyone in one place the same hours in a day when people have different shifts and they're not always crossing paths it's harder to kind of um, you know come together to collectively and bargain collectively with an employer in that way. So I think tech can be really useful there. And then the other side, which um, you guys already touched on, is the kind of knowing, telling workers what their options are. So whether it's kind of knowing that their, you know, their pay is not as good as the employer down the road. So maybe they need to start asking for a pay rise or thinking about looking elsewhere, whether it's kind of just being aware of like what other options are out there that gives them kind of more power in the workplace and, and, and kind of not just, you know, that what options kind of in terms of like the number of jobs that are out there but also like knowing that actually there are these jobs that fit my personal circumstances whether it's someone who has caring responsibilities um you know we, we've heard a lot in in focus groups that we've done that people with you know people who need certain types of flexible working to fit around childcare, for example or uh, working um, kind of trying to manage a health condition alongside work um, are often really worried about not being able to find a, another job that kind of suits their preferences so being able to show workers what's out there is really um really important um I, and that can kind of um have um important consequences for, for kind of um people's um working and you know whether they're they're getting a good deal in the workplace and then i think um we've we kind of had a panel earlier about skills and i think you know more visibility around what skills people what skills employers are looking for um and helping um put workers in touch with the kind of training opportunities is also kind of um a really important role of tech but i won't kind of go into that because lots of people will have been here for for the morning um session but yeah i think there's kind of lots of opportunities out there it's just kind of making sure that they are um the the right kinds of tech and not the kind of surveillance tech that people are so worried about Loads of to unpack there, talked about structures of organizations, the role of data, impact on labor rights, uh, how do we ensure collective bargaining in the new context? Um, are there any questions from the audience before I ask any more questions that we have pre-prepared? Or is everybody very quiet and digesting um, all of the information after lunch? Um, I think there is a question over there. And, and um, you can introduce yourself and, and say whether you, your question is for a particular member of the panel or for everybody. Uh, yes, my name is Nushin. Yeah, uh, it's been suggested that um, self-employed earn less than the employed. Um, so how could we, because we have a big population of self-employed people, how could we make sure that self-employed are, are earned as much as the employed people?
Uh, on, on balance, the people who are self-employed with us earn about the same or more in many cases. Um, so I'm probably not the best person to answer this question because that's not the, it, like, it doesn't have to be that way, basically. <laughs> Um, but it's very, it's more dependent on this kind of the steadier flow of work. Um, and that again is one of the responsibilities of the employment provider, work provider. Um, oh, yeah. I thank you for the question. Um, we have a lot of members who are obviously self-employed in the union. They are on the lower paired sort of side of the spectrum um i guess that's just sort of the nature of them joining a union so it's kind of a, a unique selection of, of self-employed workers um and i think there are some yeah anomalies in terms of the self-employed again i'm not sure the full statistics we'll have to look it up in some sectors that's the case but on the whole i don't think that's sort of for every single sector that the diverse self-employed community work in um but from just conversations and experiences from our membership um i guess what fr frustrates them quite often is the fact that they just have to accept a job sometimes they can't go back and sort of bargain over the different rates because it's very easy for clients or whoever they're working with to go find um, another freelancer or self-employed worker that might be starting out and sort of looking to build up their experience and might offer accept a job for, for a lower rate um, and that is obviously quite challenging when you are sort of competing in that environment and I think for, for us, obviously, that transparency is quite key. Um, you know, what is the rate in certain sectors that people can, I guess, in a way, bargain around? Obviously, they don't have collective bargaining rights at the moment. Um, and it sort of then opens the, um, the door to what the gender pay gap might be in self-employment. There's very little information around that. Um, so I think we have to have that further information and insight as to actually what's going on in in pay across the different sectors that the very diverse self-employed um, workforce operate in. But in addition to that, action around late payments, loads of our members don't get paid on time. Um, we as a union try and help chase those payments um, to get that money back into their pockets. That obviously impacts massively if you are lower paid and you're waiting uh, for that paycheck to come in whilst you're still trying to get uh, sort of jobs and, and more work. But then on top of that, there's not that safety net that obviously employees are entitled to around sick pay. Um, in particular, which was sort of top priority for our members and was exacerbated during the pandemic when actually they realise if they don't have any work then they don't have any money and they can't pay their bills. Um, so for us at Community, that's a, a real priority for our self-employed and freelance membership, providing that safety net. Um, so, you know, when times do get tough, they do have something to rely on. It should be, for us, a basic, no matter what employment status you operate in. Um, so I guess there's, yeah, a number of those things. It's that power to to really bargain for that higher rate, uh, the transparency, but securing that safety net and and good quality work, good quality self employment. No matter what your status might be, you should have that good quality um, work. So there's yeah, a range of stuff I think that creates that that issue for some for some workers in in the self employed and freelance section of the economy. <laughs> yeah, um, and I think in our uh, I'll echo a lot of what Kate just said and, and what I said earlier, and a lot of our recommendations around a minimum set of worker rights, a lot of the, that would apply regardless of employment status and uh, if you're just engaged in work, but a lot of the benefits are for the self-employed. So for example, ensuring minimum wage, national living wage applies to the self-employed, which it doesn't. Um, that might be complicated to actually do in practice, but we think it's a principle that should be pursued. Um, as I said earlier, ensuring the self-employed can form part of bargaining units so they can have collective bargaining uh, where it, they seem fit, they, 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 they think it's necessary. Um, also, the, the access to data I said earlier would, I think, empower self-employed workers um, and put, give them more, uh, put them more in the driving seat rather than uh, platforms, uh, employers, or the people intermediating work. Um, and, then, and then the last thing, potentially, to come back to worker tech is... Uh, to think about worker tech as a platform for other services. So if you do have a platform, again, like like Rodeo, I, I'm sure others are, are available, that is collecting data about what's happening with uh, atypical workers. That is a service to the self-employed, to the workers themselves, but it also could be a potential platform for other services to those individuals, providing um, access to pension payments, where, again, the self-employed have, uh, you know, a weaker kind of pension provision or access to kind of collective things around sick pay or saving collective savings mechanisms. So I think there are 
and also training opportunities that could be provided through the platform. So I think thinking not just about what can we do in terms of access to data for workers, but also once you've got this platform, what can you do on top of it that supports the self-employed to um, take whatever step they want to next? That's great. Um, over there, and that, let's let's take a couple of questions together. So, thank you. <clears throat> so this is a question directed towards Emma and uh, Jiga as well. Um, but Emma, you spoke about how um, we can use platforms to enable more power for for workers, and the question that I have is, what stake what stakeholders have to be involved at what level and to what degree before we can see a material change in um, the workers' conditions, and can an individual organization make a sizable change in work culture? How realistic is that? Shall I just fire away? So um, my question is around, um, so these come organizations that provide labor <laughs> are also like a way to create assets and future value. And I'm gonna ask like a kind of healthy sound snippets in what you see around uh, my question. Uh, the people who ha are like participating daily, maybe not long-term, like daily performance, providing value here and now, gig workers or short-term, they also like create the future value of the company, but generally they are the ones who don't have access and um, so we are trying to build in this space where people who don't have, like they participate to the future value, but has not been offered at all. So it's, I'm talking about ownership, maybe not like governance ownership, but at least the financial future value of the company. Thank you. Really good question. So I'll hand over to Emma first on the first question about which stakeholders need to be involved and can one organization change the system? <laughs> oh, please. But we're not alone. Like, we're not the only one. Um, uh, yeah, we, we have a special flavor of what we're doing, but we're definitely not alone in this work. Um, the I think there has to be a success story, just to this first question. There has to be a really big success story. And I don't think that is in the UK yet. I think there are quite a few in other countries elsewhere, but I don't think that there's one here. Um uh, to actually start making an impact to kind of policy level to drive investment to really bring the kind of money that this sector needs and doesn't have access to at the moment for all sorts of different reasons so yes and no there's a real woolly response um the in so far as people need to be i mean every level like you can't you can't do it without working with people who are very close to the okay this thing happened when I went to a care visit and the person who's responsible for helping the team with the rotors then changed my shift and I didn't know that that was possible to do and I have an issue with that so I'm going to talk to the software engineer and have a real massive moan about that and I can talk directly to the software engineer and tell him how pissed off I am about this feature <laughs> So there's that kind of direct access thing. Um, and then there's representation. So obviously like there's a, a co-production around kind of board level. So, so that's sort of built into our rules, but more significantly rather than that sort of very, you know, six weekly, eight weekly kind of contact, there has to be the, the daily, the weekly, um, uh, yeah, I can't, it's really complicated way of doing it, but, I, I can't really see any other way. <laughs> um, so yeah, what that means in practice is members and owners of the organization taking on roles that are usually specialized. Um, so 
recruitment numbers, uh, um, assessments, um, all the all, all of the other bits and pieces of work associated with running an organization um, and being able to package that up uh, to spread it out and to make it kind of manageable to do alongside uh, the the care. Yeah. <laughs> um, just very briefly on the future value question. Um, as a cooperative, you can distribute your profits to share to your owners. I'm really looking forward to the day when we're able to do that. <laughs> because um, we're still looking for investment and to be able to grow. So um, we're not making a profit, but that's kind of built into the business model to be able to participate in that future value. Um, and yeah, for other kind of governance forms like uh, company, there's a, a mutual good form of company and there's sort of others, others like with the golden share and um, CIC kind of arrangements that allow that. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I'll stop there. Anybody else wants to comment on the future value? Anna? Um, I can I can say a little bit about kind of um, the value of having workers kind of ha have a voice in the company, given that they're they're kind of obviously driving lots of the value. I mean, it's definitely um, something that that we've kind of um, thought about in the context of our wider work, the the role of um, workers having a, a voice in company boards. Um, not not even just for kind of um about kind of pay and, and kind of um um remuneration but also to encourage investment in the right things that the company needs be that kind of you know machinery or training or whatever it might be um and then i think kind of more widely like there's definitely a, a valuable role especially when we've kind of seen you know the, the a kind of longer term decline in kind of worker voice coming through uh, things like the trade union uh, movement to kind of make sure that that's being captured uh, in in some way, even if it's kind of in a, a slightly different way. I mean, one thing we've looked at is kind of um, less formal kind of uh, committees within organisations. I think our view is kind of it's not it's not really a substitute for kind of formal kind of trade union uh, voice or, or in other ways, but it's kind of, you know, it, it's there, there could be other mechanisms that the business could think about, be it kind of um, access to boards or be it elsewhere to make sure that in some way the voice of workers is, is being captured because it's kind of very much, you know, that workers on the ground will know best what the problems are. And that could, you know, not only be the problems that are affecting the workers, but also things that are going to affect the business's growth in the long term. So, um, yeah, definitely lots of interesting ideas. Just going quickly, I think Hannah touched on um, a lot of things I was going to mention, but uh, just to look at sort of the broader picture on, on your question, and I think we have to really change the culture um, of how businesses uh, sort of engage with workers and unions in the UK. I think a lot of that starts from the top, and I think the government has to lead by example in that respect and sort of set that best practice of how we want to see a social partnership in the UK where you know um workers are seen as a really key stakeholder that they are engaged in sort of um future value and ownership and sort of the financial future value of the company that you refer to as a particular example but I really think that's sort of a, a wider culture change that we'd want to see from a government level that you know really speaks to businesses in that way and where there isn't more of an open door for for worker representatives and for unions to be involved in those conversations and it's not just a tick box exercise it's something that's really meaningful and valuable um, which is obviously a, a whole other issue that I'm, I can't solve. Um, but when we want to see that wider change in culture, I think that would make a huge difference. So it completely depends on the government. Um, but that's really important, I think. I'll just come in as well. Uh, just maybe try to address both questions at once. <clears throat> um, actually, from a business perspective, no business wants to have to compete on, in a race on you know lower wages and lower worker standards. They don't want to do that because it's a race that no one can win. And it just leads to really bad practices that they just don't want to have to do that. Every most businesses, and I'm gonna, you know, really high percentage, all they want to do is compete on customer service, high quality, high value. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we've uh, opted for a for raising the floor on minimum worker on worker rights with this, you know, minimum set of worker rights, is because the higher you can raise that floor 
it means businesses can be freed up to compete on other business models and create other ways of, of engaging with the workers. They can, they can be consultative and they can be collaborative with workers. They can have new business models where they can share profits rather than be it being kind of a zero sum game between the two. Um, and and to, to kind of echo Kay's point, that then comes back to the role of government to say, okay, no, uh, we, we can have labor market flexibility. We can have a competitive labor market, a healthy labor market, but that looks like, you know, a high floor on worker rights and standards. It means we're going to enforce the rights that we put in place, and and you know, maybe tech can help with that as well. Um, and and I think that's when you open up uh, a, a slightly different conversation. There are things on sharing data that the government can do today that it's just choosing not to or, or being passive about. So I think there's a lot of things that start with the kind of the mentality of from government that says, actually, the way we create a high wage economy is by um, encouraging, uh, you know, competition on value, customer service, not on low wages, low worker standards. And on that note, I'm afraid we'll have to close the discussion in the panel. Uh, so thank you, Jagar. Emma, Hannah, and Kate, and I'll hand over to Emma to introduce the next section. Thank you, Clara, and um, the panel. Really interesting to hear such different perspectives on worker power. Um, so on that note, we're now going to head up into our second breakout sessions of the day. Um, so the first one is going to be on better labor platforms with Adam and Funder from Fair Work, who are the organization that rate gig platforms across the world. And the other session is going to be on worker choice and worker power with Dharma Sadhyanathan from Green, uh, Bethlehem Green Ventures, a long term advocate and investor in tech for good. So I'll invite you to uh, head upstairs. Um, the team will be kind of on their way showing you where to go. Yeah, if everybody just comes in, thank you very much. Get your biscuits. Um, I think you know I'm Gavin Kelly, chair of the Resolution Foundation. Um, welcome to our, our final panel session today, uh, where we are going to sort of take a broader lens and look at the future of good work. Um, and I hope we can pull together some of the threads across the day, uh, because we're going to hear a bit like we did at the start of the day, we're going to return to, we're going to hear from a kind of a social investment, impact investment perspective. We're going to hear uh, from the world of policy uh, and we're going to hear um, from real experts on, 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 on the kind of the challenges of putting tech to, to into, into work in the workplace in a progressive way rather than a regressive way. So um, uh, I'm going to introduce our three speakers. I think the way we'll try and do this is that we'll get each of our speakers to introduce kind of themselves and how their organization, what they do relates to the topic uh, of this panel. Uh, but then we'll sort of take a step back and sort of try and explore some areas that they would like to see developed in terms of innovation uh, to improve work. And then hopefully we can, at the end, finish with a uh, really big picture. What would you really like to see to put the world, to put the world right and send us, send us on our way uh, with a spring and a step? I do hope um, if people, I know it's been a long day, but I hope if you've got questions, you will be marshalling them and we'll, um, we'll, we'll make a bit of space to, to come to you. So please do uh, rouse yourself with some questions to put to our panel. Um, and we'll make sure we finish on time because I, I do appreciate the, 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 the time that people have been here. It's been a great day. Um, so uh, I'm gonna introduce our first speaker who is uh, on my left. I should say, by the way, I feel like I've got a Bunsen burner behind me. This screen is a, uh, I hate to think what the, what the carbon emission from this, uh, I've never known a heat like it. So if, we, if, we, if, you, if we're all in shirts and you're all in jumpers, you're impressed by this. It won't be there in an hour, I tell you. It's protective. It's protective, yeah. It's very, very hot. Um, so our first speaker is Paul Pissack. I imagine Paul will be known to many of you. Um, Paul runs the Joseph Rowntree Foundation. Uh, and uh, has thought hard about these issues. He's also, Paul, he, Paul has done, uh, he was at the top of Whitehall for a, a very long time. So he also brings kind of deep policy, governmental insight uh, to these questions. 
Um, but that's who we'll hear from first. Then we're going to hear from Daniel Satter, who's the chief executive of Big Issue Invest, uh, probably the most, I think, important social impact investor, social investor uh, we have around, um, uh, and someone and a friend of the Resolution Foundation. So we're really delighted to have uh, Danielle's expertise here. And then we're going to hear on my right from Anna Thomas, who's the co-founder and director uh, all things at the Institute for the Future of Work, who is a great organization. They've really carved out a, a role for themselves in a, in a, in a crowded uh, landscape, but they've kind of made this question about technology and how it impacts on the workplace and what you can do about it to mold it for the better their own uh, in a really impressive way in recent years. So I'm looking forward to hearing from Anna too. Uh, but let me turn to Paul to kick off. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um... I don't think, oh, sorry. I don't think most of you will know me, so I'll, I'll um, just by way of introduction. Um, as Kevin says, I'm the Chief Executive of the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, and um, JRF is an anti-poverty social change organization. Um, and if you're, if you're wondering what a social change organization is, then maybe we'll get a bit into that through the conversation, because it is a deliberately um broad slash confused kind of title to give to an organization reflecting the fact that we do many different things um and i spend a lot of my time wondering are we doing the right things are we doing too many too few are that the right balance etc and um maybe we'll get into that a bit later on when we think about how to have the biggest impact on on good work um, but just to start with the sort of obvious point like what, why is jrf interested in good work and, and this is the sort of um the, the, the negative bit, if you like, um, uh, is, but not a surprising bit, which is that um, there is a lot of in-work poverty. Um, and in many respects, in-work poverty is something that has been getting worse, um, certainly during my policy lifetime. So if you go back to the mid-1990s onwards, it's basically been getting worse in various ways since then. Um, you know, roughly speaking, about one in 10 workers in the UK uh, will be in poverty. I'm saying roughly partly because the, the figures are a bit all over the place because of the pandemic at the moment. It, I think on the eve of the pandemic, it was about 13% of all workers were in poverty. Um, I, I, another way of looking at that and, and seeing the change is that if you, um, if you look at the, the working age households who are in poverty um, today, um, roughly two thirds of those, a bit more than two thirds of those on the eve of the pandemic, had somebody who was actually in work, and despite being in work, they were in poverty. If you go back to 1997, um, which is actually when the, the, I think the data was first collected, that was 50%. So what that tells us is that, I mean, it is still the case that work is the best way out of poverty. And we should never be in any doubt of that for those people who can work, of course, and many people can't. Um, but for those who can, work is the best route out of poverty, but it is in some regards becoming less effective at taking people out of poverty than it used to. Um, and just for the audience now, where, where I'm talking about poverty there, I'm using the standard sort of 60% of the median line, which sometimes gets people saying, well, that's not real poverty, is it? I mean, I'd argue it is, of course, but like um, uh, we, well, GRF, we look at deeper forms of poverty as well. So recently we've done quite a lot of work around very deep poverty, which is when you go from 60% of the median to 40% of the median. So a much lower level of income. And there's been a very significant growth over about 20 year period of the number of people in very deep poverty and around about half of those uh, are actually in working households. And then if you go to our very, very deepest form of poverty that we analyze, which we call destitution, and we had quite a big report out in uh, a couple of weeks ago about very, very rapidly rising levels of destitution, which is quite worrying. And even at that level, you go right down to that level, you can find people who are actually receiving um, income from paid work. About one in 10 of the people who are destitute are, um, are in work. So um, that's, that's the sort of long answer to why do we actually care about good work, just in terms of our core mission around poverty at JRF. And it's the, that's, the, that's the sort of depressing bit, if you like. Um, I'll try and keep it a bit more upbeat as we're coming towards the end of the... <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, one of the questions is, like, what, what's going on here? Because actually, and then here's a bit of um, light, I hope, is that one of the great success stories in British policymaking uh, over the last sort of 10, 20 years, and I would argue that is actually a relatively short list, um, but one of the things is the national living wage. And actually, we're, we're now at a point where I think the national living wage is close to two thirds of median wage. That's an extraordinary achievement. Um, and, you know, 
if, if we want to leave here this evening with a sort of sense of hope in the art of the possible, then, you know, just imagine what it would have been like 20 years ago, even thinking about introducing, um, you know, a, a living wage that would, um, you know, get to that point. We know we need to keep going with that. There are all sorts of challenges with it, particularly around enforcement. But it's a, it's a huge success story, actually, in this country that we have a national living wage, which is actually one of the highest in the world, I think. Um, so this is not principally a problem with um, hourly wage. Um, but it is a problem with the way in which jobs are constructed. Um, and so when we look at those people who are in very deep poverty and in work, you know, how do people escape from very deep poverty through work? It's not just getting into work if you're not in work. It's also those transitions from part time to full time. So it's the number of hours, which is absolutely critical. Um, it's around job security. So moving from temporary work to permanent work. It's moving from unsalaried work to salaried work. So you know, the, the route out of poverty is not just no work to work, it is those aspects of the nature of work, um, which is where we start getting into questions of, of you know, what is good work. Um, alongside that, though, you know, just, uh, that, that's it for the numbers, that's it for the quant, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, the, other, the other way in which we look at poverty within the foundation is as, uh, as an experience, you know, to some degree an emotional, relational experience that people have, you know, what is it like to be in poverty? Um, and I think that's where you really get into the heart of what good work is about, or perhaps more obviously what bad work is about as experienced by people on, on low incomes. I think I'm right in saying that if you, if you go back about 20 years-ish, there used to be a, a, a sort of premium, a well-being premium for being on low pay. So it was almost like the compensation for being on low pay is you, you were generally happier, uh, actually, than um, people who are further up the um, income spectrum but more stressed out. Um, I, I don't think that's reversed, but it's definitely been um, significantly taken out. You know, you, it's you, gone. There's, it, there's, yeah, there's, there's basically yeah. no difference now. Yeah. So, so there is. The, you've lost the compensation <laughs> for being on low pay, um, and actually, what you have are a lot of low paid workers who are feeling the stresses, the insecurities, the precariousness of the nature of work at the moment. Um, we talk a lot in the foundation about dignity and respect. Um, so we talk a lot in, in quite moral language about what people are owed in this country, and sometimes that is about money, but a lot of the time it's about dignity and respect and how do you create workplaces which um, afford people greater dignity and respect. Often I think that comes to questions of security, we maybe come back to you know what, what it is about security. Um, we have, I think, very low levels of security in certain sectors in particular in this, in this country. Um, it can be about autonomy and voice and a sense of power. I think there have been sessions previously about, um, you know, collective voice, which is really critical. It can be about a sense of progression and training and not feeling stuck. So all of these things come together as important aspects of the nature of, um, of, of good work. Um, just to finish off and it just loop back a little bit to, um, you know, what is JRF doing about this um, to tee up going into conversation later? So, so we... Uh, we are a policy think tank to some degree. Um, we don't call ourselves a think tank, and for some reason, whenever I say we're a think tank in the organization, people frown at me, but we sort of are a think tank, or at least we have a think tank element. We do thinking, I hope, and we do research analysis, and we produce policy um, uh, documentation and recommendations. Um, but we are also a campaigning organization. Um, you know, Principally at the moment, we are campaigning around upgrading uh, benefits and the, the basic rate of universal credit, our big campaign with Trussell Trust, but we do campaign in other areas. We've been um, very supportive uh, to, of the, the living, living wage campaign um, and very much part of that, um, that journey. Um, we also focus on movement building. Um, so within this context, then obviously union power is a critical element of it, but we would um, we, we fund grassroots organizations, we fund people who are in low pay to you know, shape their own policy agenda and um, give voice to their own uh, approaches to tackling these, uh, these issues. Uh, and we're also an investor. So we are a social investor, so about, around about 5% um, of our endowment is uh, ring fenced for social investments, which is about 20 million pounds at the moment. Um, and we invest through worker tech, but we also invest in housing, social investments and other things. So we are a social investor, but it's, it's very much one of the tools in our toolkit. Um, and then the other bit, which, it, which sometimes underestimate, and I think foundations tend to underestimate, is that the lion's share of our money, the bit that we're not spending, or we're not actually putting into social investment as defined, we are nevertheless putting into investments. Um, and it, you know, I have a sense that there's no such thing as a no impact investment. If you're investing in something, you are having an impact. You're making a choice. Yeah. You're, you're making a choice, you're having an impact. You might not be thinking about the impact you're making, but you, you are making an impact. And I think one of the big challenges for 
sort of financially well endowed foundations at the moment, and, that, and quite a lot of foundations are going through this this process thinking about it, is that this model where you don't think very much about the 96% of your wealth because it's just sitting, you know, growing, and then you've, you're absolutely relentlessly focused on the impact you're having with your 4% annually, and I'm not saying you shouldn't be relentlessly focused on the 4%, but what on earth are you doing with the 96%? And, and part of the journey we're going on as a foundation at the moment is thinking more uh, about uh, the way in which we're doing our mainstream investments, and, and certainly during 2024, that's going to be a big uh, theme for our uh, conversations with trustees so so we're very fortunate in the fact that we have lots of tools in the toolkit you know I think the legitimate question laid back to me frequently by my own trustees is why are we doing so many different things can't you just make your mind up and specialize um, and there might be a case for that but actually an area like good work I think lends itself to exactly that kind of mixed approach um, you know, we're not going to solve it through mainstream policy and genteel conversations with my old friends in Whitehall, nor are we going to solve it all through social investment, frankly, but the right combination of different things tackling different problems holds out the prospect of making some progress. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. Fantastic. Um, and I want to come back to this kind of balance, balanced approach and, and how you get it right and how to think about it, because it's, it's something we grapple with at the Resolution Foundation. And I think it's uh, across the debate on kind of better work, good work, there is just a how much of our effort should be focused on the, the law, how much of it should be focused on employers trying out new stuff, which no one's done before. So let's come back to that. And just on the optimistic note, because it's important, I'm old enough to remember that in 2014, we published a report saying uh, that minimum wage, as it then was, should go up to, we should set an aspiration of reaching 60% of the median by uh, 2020, which much to our surprise, the government completely accepted. Yeah. Uh, and when we did that, the FT, The Economist, and The Times, and just about anyone else you get to mention, all use different words like insane, reckless, uh, you know, yada, yada, about us. And it was a whole, it was a real thing for us. I mean, we got really, really done over for being so wild. Um, so I don't take any pleasure at all in, in, <laughs> in reminding any of those people. But it does show you uh, how the world does change. And all those people now say, oh, it's, of course, you know, it's a very conceptual thing and the, it was a very reasonable thing to do. Uh, and quite, and it's good that they do say that. But uh, the world does change. And it, actually, that wasn't that long ago. So uh, optimism. Uh, Danielle, talk to us about, so, you know, from a social investment perspective, what, how does this topic today relate to what you do and uh, how should we? How would you like us to think about what social investment can offer? This 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 question. <clears throat> no, thank you. Um, I um, uh, and and what you've said, Paul, really resonates. Especially the kind of the focus, prioritize. I actually have hand gestures for this. It's like focus, prioritize. That's what the the management consultants tell us to do, and we kind of say it's it's more complicated than than that. Uh, but the, the big issue invests a little bit about about big issue invest and and the big issue. Uh, 1991, uh, Gordon Roddick and John Bird set up uh, the big issue, and the idea was to give people a way to work their way out of poverty. Uh, I think, in truth, it's a way of working out of destitution and into poverty. Uh, but I think saying I'm working towards poverty is is probably not not the right <laughs> kind of branding uh, that that they should have. And, and at the time, what could you do if you were, if you were on the street? Um, if you wanted to sell something, and I'm talking about material things that you can sell, uh, you can sell cigarettes uh, and you can sell newspapers. Uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that John Bird and uh, Gordon Roddick chose to sell newspapers rather than cigarettes. You can imagine a big issue brand to this day. Um, a brand with, uh, I think it's 78% uh, brand recognition in households. It's quite an extraordinary thing um, they, they created. But the idea was providing a way for people to earn an income. And that's absolutely true today. Our vendors buy the magazine from us for two pounds fifty. Sorry, they buy it for they buy it for two pounds and they sell it for four pounds. It changes around Christmas. We always boost the price up around Christmas. Um, a quarter of the copies get sold at Christmas. So uh, please buy your um, your big issue. Uh, but they right from that very beginning, they realized that uh, it's really hard getting ventures going. And they, uh, in 2005, Nigel Kershaw and John Bird set up Big Issue Invest to invest in organizations like the Big Issue. So at the moment, we invest in uh, 140 different organizations um, in the portfolio. We've got about 45 million uh, under management, and it's everything from startup 
uh, what I call kind of bread and butter finance. You know, you want to convert a few units above a shop into uh, refuge accommodation for women fleeing domestic violence. Well, 150 grand to East Durham Community Initiative. Um, you want to turn your uh, your books by diverse publishers uh, into audiobooks to raise more money. Well, there's 45 grand to hire two people for six months to try that out. Um, all the way through to our growth money. Where do you get money for growth? So when Be Caring, um, it's a care organization, but it's a worker co-op. How could they get finance? Uh, I think Emma was here earlier today in, in that space. Um, so that's where we step in to all these places where regular means, mainstream finance should be there, but doesn't quite get there. Uh, and now a day's equity. Um, how do you put equity into the for-profit social purpose space, into the co-op space? So we have a small um, equity fund that we're running. So we both do direct lending. I'm also um, authorized and regulated by the FCA uh, because we have um, four or five of these FCA regulated funds. So I have um, unlimited liability for the conduct of the business. Uh, post financial crisis, nobody gets to walk away. Uh, and I think that's a very good thing. I will regret saying it's a very good thing if it goes horribly wrong. So why are we um, interested in uh, where does the overlap with good work happen? And I think it happens all across the portfolio. It's there in the big issue, because right now, Paul Cheel, who runs the big issue side of the big issue group, he's set up big issue e-bikes to say, well, our vendors uh, can sell magazines. What other things can people like our vendors do? Um, so we have an e-bikes uh, joint venture. We have a clothing upcycling joint venture. We have big issue recruit, where we look to place our vendors into mainstream um, employment. So within the big issue, we're still pushing out that work piece. And then we invest across the portfolio, all the places where people struggle to get into the workforce. We invest in prisoner education um, to maintain education, both in prison to outside of prison. So you get your qualification, you're less likely to fall uh, into, into unemployment. So good work just falls across everything we do. And I think in truth, um, selling the big issue is not good work. Mm. Uh, it's, it's a really uh, it's tough good. thing to do, mm. really tough. Uh, and I think there's also an incredible bravery uh, in our vendors, because when you, when you look around this, um, uh, this platform or, or amongst the room, you never know what story lies behind our, our faces. But when you see a big issue vendor, you will think there's a reason why that person is a big issue vendor. Something must have happened to them that they hit a point in their life and they're now on their way up and they've come to sell the magazine. So I think that's an incredibly brave thing uh, that, our, that our vendors do out there when they, when they sell the magazine. That's a kind of bit of, bit of overview stuff. For, for social investment in this space, you know, our whole job, we're like the plumbers uh, of, of the economy. Um, we take, uh, there are pools of money there are people that need money. As a social investment organization, we just put the pipework in that connects the money from where it is to where it's to where it's needed. And I, I really, the, the statement, all, all investments have impact. We're just choosing to count it, I think is one bit. And the second thing I'd say is, um, why do we only have to make money out of the bad stuff? It's like, why, why is it oil and gas and coal? Um, why can't we make some money out of the good stuff? And I think that's what we get to do in, uh, in social investment. Uh, Daniel, thank you so much. Uh, everybody needs a good plumber. That's, uh, so um, we will come back, and I want to come back to you, I think, on just where, where, where we should be taking social investment. What, you know, basically, how would you like to see this pan out over the next five years? What, what's a plausible scale of ambition in the sort of space we're in? Uh, both for growing kind of the, the worker tech space, but just more widely for social investment doing good. So we'll come we'll come back to that. But um, but let let's 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 go on to Anna. Anna, talk to us about what you do at your place, um, and t take us back to the issue which we started off on this morning, which is really kind of technology is a huge powerful force, uh, but to some degree it's a malleable force. It's kind of subject to social sort of social power and we can sort of kind of affect how it plays out in the workplace in all sorts of ways for good and for ill and that's something which I know you focus on so so, so give us your perspective on that. Um, thank you very much um, for having me thank you. 
Um, uh, and a huge thank you to Louise too and to Resolution Ventures, um, which is a fantastic um, uh, venture uh, that we've been following um, and supporting um, and hope to continue to do that. Um, we um, are at the Institute for the Future of Work, our research and development institute, um, examining uh, the impacts of technology on work and working lives. You said, um, uh, Gavin, at the beginning that you were very small at resolution, but compared to us, you're enormous. We're really very small. Um, but um, we do have a fantastic network of um, patrons, partners, research fellows, um, many of you in this room. Um, we run also the All Party Parliamentary Group on the Future of Work. Um, we partner with Digit, for example, the ESRC um, funded uh, Future of Work Centre. Um, we are going to be um, uh, co-chairing. Oh, so, sorry. Oh, um, sorry but this is this is the boring bit. So that, that's okay. But the um, we're going to be co-chairing the Future of Work group of the new Responsible AI uh, program from the government, um, and we also host and run the Peace Readers Review, um, generously funded by the Nuffield Foundation, um, examining the impacts of technology on work and well-being. Um, so uh, what we do, we do actually have a framework. People are always saying, what is good work? And we have got a framework called a Good Work Charter, which isn't a prescriptive um, framework, but it's a very broad sort of organizing framework that's been used um, in different ways by different stakeholders, um, researchers, policymakers, even investors to some extent. Um, and it's useful, um, although I won't go through it for this, um, uh, this audience, um, as, um, because it captures principles of good work, which interestingly do fit very well with AI and tech principles. We've sort of done a matching exercise and they work really well together. Um, it captures rights, so um, nationally and internationally, um, soft and hard law, um, and it also operates as a kind of checklist of impacts of technology at work. So of course we need much more research on that, we're all working on that, um, but it's a fantastic base we're finding to start, to start, to start from. So uh, we organise our work around three core challenges, changing work, where the challenge is um, that the risks and rewards of technology are not evenly spread, um, shifting power, that technology is driving big shifts in uh, power and challenging traditional uh, mechanisms for governance and accountability, um, and three, prioritising people, where people um, uh, with uh, lived experience and human values as well are not brought into this conversation at different levels. And that's particularly important because the future of work um, is such a, is, is um, as we've heard to, today, very fragmented, very fragmented and fragmented in terms of the topics, fragmented in terms of the stakeholders um, and fragmented in terms of the policy response too. So that's the background. So um, what do we... Um, uh, what do we what do we do? Um, I thought um, I would uh, give some examples of that, but pulling out things that perhaps we've talked about less throughout the day, um, uh, so as not to uh, duplicate that. Um, focusing on risks, um, automation impacts, and uh, thinking in a joined up way through the tech life cycle. So, and in each of those, I'll give an example of what we think is happening in a big sense, what we're doing and what we're doing about it. So first of all, risks. So we've heard a huge amount of the potential of technology, and that's right, we're also techno-optimists. Um, but, um, and in particular, it has huge potential to understand past patterns of behavior and resource and identify new intervention points um, and direct um, its capabilities towards solving some of the huge problems that we're facing right across the country. Um, but also because of the capabilities, because of the way machine learning in particular learns from past patterns um, of a behavior, it picks up assumptions and it picks up stereotypes um, and it can um, multiply those um, at pace and at speed. Uh, it, they, these things will be projected into the future. Um, unless there is positive intervention. And there's also much more data um, and the fusion of data, as we've seen with ChatGPT, among other things, um, and, the, and less information about exactly how that's being used, um, which feeds growing uh, 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 information symmetries in the workplace. 
um, um, and is particularly tricky, particularly tricky when you're looking at not just the protected characteristics that are currently covered by the Equality Act, um, but other ones too. Um, and you're thinking about thousands and thousands of data points that may change as well continually as decisions are made. So, if so, we think that that needs to be understood and interrogated in order to be able to maximise the opportunities too. And things that we've done on it um, are. Um, a quality impact assessment, so moving beyond technical audits, um, analysing auditing tools and finding how very deficient they often are and how nobody's using them consistently and no one really understands what's happening. Um, and, um, and we're developing a model for a good work algorithmic impact assessment, which thinks about impacts, not just on equality, not just on bias, not just technically, um, but on social conditions and social impacts that includes quality and work. Um, and doing guidance for employers and trade, union, trade unions too. Um, uh, the next thing we're doing is thinking about automation impacts. So um, in the uh, Pista Readers Review, we're thinking about automation impacts um, and ar archetypes of automation in different ways. And that's important, we think, because it structures risks and impacts differently. Um, and, it, and, it, and it leads to different outcomes outcomes for different groups and different people and again unless we sort of get into the surface of that um, it's it's hard to respond in a way that will really um, address the risks and maximize the opportunities um, the automation archetypes that we are um, that we're that we're looking at are substitution that's the one everyone talks about robots taking your jobs and a new firm level survey that um, we've done with Warwick Business School um, and has just come out finds that 79 percent of firms across the country are using AI and automation technologies to, to automate both cognitive and manual tasks. And with SMAEs doing it at the same rate uh, for cognitive tasks as manual tasks, so it's happening at a very fast pace. Um, but and, and, it, and it's hugely important, but it's not the only arch archetype. There's also augmentation. Um, as an archetype, so that so where these technologies can either augment and increase the discretion that you use, um, for example, helping you do your job, a radiologist for diagnosis, or it can do the opposite of that. Um, and often it can do the same things concurrently, and they have to be weighed up. Um, and the, uh, perhaps an example of where it's uh, where it's low discretion is when a driver is instructed in a very close way exactly how to. Um, to perform his duties. And now I think I'm running out of time, so I better hurry up. But the other ones are intensification, telepresence, so that you can either be freed up for home working or you could be surveilled um, and surveyed and matching. So an automated matching of individuals to tasks and jobs, which again can work very well or can perpetuate stereotypes. Um, uh, what we're doing with that, um, among other things, is a fantastic survey on capabilities, which hasn't yet coming up, but we've got the researcher here, um, Magda, um, Magdalena Sophia, who's uh, done it. Um, and uh, through that survey, which puts together the capabilities approach with technology um, and focus groups, um, we are informing our model for a preemptive uh, impact assessment much more closely. Um, it's also broadening the skills debate from thinking of something that is done to you after the damage is done to um, really identifying positive options and choices as early as possible um, in the ways when decisions um, are taken um, and also uh, informing our work on, on rights and information rights um, that uh, are needed uh, to allow this to um, uh, to 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 resonate. Uh, well, thank you, Anna. That's a huge amount uh, of work that you're doing uh, at your place. It's fantastic, and I want to come back to some. Of, I want to get you, you hear your voice on where you'd like to see us, if you like, trying to try things out, trying to find new ventures, because that's a, a wide set of issues and problems and challenges. Um, so I want to, to hear you on where we should be trying to deploy our resources. Um, on which, um, Paul, let me come to you um, to start with. Uh, I guess one of the things we struggle with, and lots of people in this space struggle with, is like what you know, where should where should we deploy our effort? Um, and we've got at our place, as I sort of mentioned earlier, lots of big policy asks, um, but we've also got this ventures work. Um, and I think wherever you go, you can always see the critique of what you're doing rightly. So we could spend a whole time writing policy reports and it feels often like they fall on deaf ears. So is that the best use of our time? 
we could spend our whole time doing investing and that, you know, it's hugely exciting and impactful, but you, you, you then worry that you're kind of investing in very small organizations, dealing with relatively small numbers of people. Haven't you seen the scale of the challenge out there? Um, JRF, I mean, you, you know, you've got a, that, exactly that challenge, I think, but you've got it on a bigger scale, you've bigger endowment, if you like, a bigger organization. How do you, you have to reach a view, particularly when you look at the world of work and the problems we face, like how, what, what's your way of navigating that challenge and, and where you spend your, your pound, if you like, of effort? Um, yeah, so you, it's absolutely right. That, that is a, a, a question we face every day as an organisation, and I'm not just in work, but in lots of other areas of policy that we're interested in, housing, etc. cetera. Um, it, I'm not going to pretend that we have a, a sort of clear formula for how we reach a view on the marginal pound. We don't. And um, I mean, my trustees would love it if we did. Um, we don't. Um, and to some degree, it's, you know, there's an art rather than a science in this. I mean, one thing we do look at is who else is operating in this space. You know, frankly, there are policy areas we're really interested in and we might not do work on because Resolution Foundation is doing work on them or, or other organizations. Oh. What's the point in, in oh. um, duplicating? And the same would be across, across other aspects. Um, I think, I mean, thinking about work and the different sort of, I mean, I was just sort of jotting down, in my head, there are sort of five types of work that all need doing. Um, some of which DRF is involved in and, and some less so. So it's absolutely the case we need national policy work. And I would argue that we need national legislative yeah. uh, interventions. And a lot of people will say, you know, legislation is a sort of sledgehammer. Well, actually, sledgehammers are pretty useful for some things. Certainly, if you want to drive a stake into the ground, you use a sledgehammer. Um, and actually, it's been a long time since we've driven some new stakes in the ground in this kind of area. And we've had repeated promises from the government. And we've got um, promises from a potential future government. So it's, it's a really, really important part of the architecture, if you like, policy architecture for, for good work. So yes, GRF would absolutely have an interest in that. We have people who are focused on policy and you know government policy making. Um, the second area for me is around unions and union power. And actually, there's a policy angle to that as well in terms of the ability for unions to um, grow their membership and get their message across in different um, workplaces. Um, I think there is a campaigning bit, which... Um, I mean, we're, we're quite quiet on, or rather we're, we're sort of in the background on, but, but, you know, the real living wage has been a campaign. Sure. Uh, living hours um, is a campaign. We're yeah. very proud to be part of that, but we tend to sort of stand behind those people who are doing it rather than, um, you know, at the front of the queue. I think there is a real question around sector approach. And actually, I know this is an area that you and Resolution have done a lot of work in and a lot of thinking about. We are not really doing anything in that space, um, except that I mean, we have a particular um, interest at the moment in outsourced workers which isn't a sector as such but is one so, of those thematic yeah. approaches because you know the things that a national policy framework can't do is get into all the differences between different sectors or different types of work i don't think as effectively as, as sort of more targeted approaches and then the final is sort of social r d if you like and, and experimentation and social investment and if i if i think we you know grf is sort of playing a role across all five of those areas and um, but we're definitely sort of you, you know more at the front of the pack in some than others um, I think what we haven't been as good at as we should be, and I think I hope we're getting better at, is actually linking between them. Yeah. So um, I think when I arrived and looked at our social investment portfolio as a foundation, I struggled to find very clear connections between a set of social investments we were doing, which were driven by a very good social investment team in the finance. I think we're getting better now at having conversation. So we have, you know, a principal policy advisor um, immersed in questions around the care market, yeah. talking with our social investment team about, well, it, these are the issues I am finding. These are the policy asks that we're coming up with. You know, what could we do in the social investment space that would actually allow us to demonstrate, you know, uh, ways forward? So I, I don't think we're great at that, but I think we're getting slightly better at it. Um, just one final thing. So one thing I try not to worry about, which you which you mentioned was scaling. Yeah. Um, I, I think partly because I spent 10 years as a treasury official where, you know, the way you killed good ideas was to ask, is it scalable? Because you knew it wasn't and you knew that would be a way of killing it. And um, so I'm very, very resistant to asking the scalability question, because partly because... You take the boy out of the treasury. <laughs> <laughs> that bit you have taken out of me. So, so, so I try not to ask the, is it going to be scalable? Because actually what we need more than anything is glimmers of hope. Uh, and I'll take a glimmer of hope even if it doesn't feel immediately scalable. 
over, you know, killing an idea at a too early a stage. So I'm very much in the kind of, you know, let flowers bloom at this stage. Let's worry about scalability at a later point. We need to have things to point to, which actually give people a sense of forward momentum rather than worrying too much about that sort of, well, how does that then translate back to the national policy framework? Great. That's really helpful. And it takes me directly on to Danielle. I wanted to kind of get you to help us get a kind of read on the sort of scale of impact that social investment can have in solving social problems that we care about in this sort of space like work, but it could be mm. the poverty premium or some other issue. Because, you know, well, Paul, Paul just made the case for don't worry about scale, it will kind of take care of itself in the long run, just kind of get some good things going, which I've got a lot of sympathy, you know, getting good things going has a lot to be said for it. But we do need to justify spending money on this rather than other stuff. Um, and there are different ways in which social investment can actually lead to wider system change over and above the behavior of one particular venture in one particular market. This is your space. So kind of walk us through how social investment can lead to wider change and sort of how that happens and how failure can lead to wider change as well as success. I've spent uh, much of my career working for uh, strong women uh, and uh, Dawn Ostwick uh, was one of them uh, who worked for the National Lotteries Community Fund. Uh, but I worked for Dawn at uh, uh, Esme Fairburn Foundation. Uh, I think no, no one is perfect. Uh, Dawn certainly wasn't. Uh, but one of the things that Dawn said uh, that really stuck with me was the power of financial language. It's very hard to argue against. You know, the model says it works or it doesn't. And, and there's, there's a kind of power there, which I think we can harness uh, and we, we should never give up our, our power. So the power of money um, comes from there is some scale. Uh, and I, I think the point about scale, it was, this is what I call Travis Hollingsworth moment of despair. Uh, he was a management consultant from a very prestigious firm who became the strategy guy at Big Society Capital. And he had to grapple with just this thing. Where, where should social investment go? So he asked 72 people in the sector and he got 72 different answers back. So being a good management consultant, he drew a four box grid and, and, he, and he threw the 72 answers into the four box so grid. There's a matrix. There's a matrix. Yeah. This, and this is what he came up with. So he said, um, first thing is um, uh, we need scale. Uh, and uh, we need scale to solve the problems we have. So 4.3 million homes in the private rented sector, three quarters of a million of them, I believe, were classed as unfit for human habitation. So if that's 100 grand a pop to fix those up, that's 75 billion. That's a big wadge of scale money that we need. But then the hope is that there's about 60 billion of outstanding finance in the social housing sector from the private sector. So scale is not impossible. Now it took from 1990 to the present day to get up to that 60 billion, but it is possible to apply very large scale chunks of money from the private sector uh, through a social lens to solve a social problem. The second bit of Travis's four box grid was to say um, bread and butter, small finance, it's absolutely fine. It was like a no contradiction message about some of the things. The other two, we're about, um, uh, we're about uh, innovation, that um, scale isn't enough. The problems are so big, we must innovate to solve them. So in the workspace, um, we actually funded um, Cornerstone in Scotland to go to the Dutch model of community care. They provide care in 17 different local authorities uh, across Scotland. And the, and the model, bad news managers, is you sack the managers, um, you replace them with coaches, and you roster them through an IT system, that matching bit that you were talking about. Uh, and, you, um, you, and you use the savings to employ better qualified staff. So you raise the quality of care out at the end of the day. So there was, there was something there about an innovation solution. And the final bit was mass participation. You must get the involvement of the public in money. And that echoes back to Dawn's um, point about the, the, the power of the language of finance, that we have allowed ourselves to be disempowered uh, by that financial language into believing it's something that we, that we can't cope with ourselves when actually we can. It's, uh, it's just money and it's, and it's fundamentally, it's our money 
40% of the invested assets in the UK pension funds. It is our money sitting there. Of one local authority, I'll stop on this one, the one local authority, they were very pleased. They said, we've allocated 50 million uh, to invest in our local area. They were a city-based uh, local authority pension fund. We thought, fantastic. Their definition of local was the European Union. So that, that sometimes, you know, we get wins, we have a little way to go. But I think if we can harness uh, our own money to solve the problems we're experiencing, not a bad thing. Thank you, Daniel. Um, now, I'm going to come to you, Anna, in a sec, but I, 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 I see with horror that time is galloping on, and I don't want to uh, fail in my basic duties as chair. So um, I'm going to, we're going to run about a couple of minutes longer. Um, I'm looking at Louise, who's ultimate, the ultimate boss in this. We're going to run a couple of minutes longer before Louise comes up and wraps us up, because I know people have got things to get to. Are there any burning questions out there from people? Um, because if there are, this is probably the time for you to start showing your your hands you may be you may be all talked out i don't know no yes we do so if we've got a mic oh yes we do brilliant there's a mic on its way anyone else for our it's probably the time for pithy questions rather than um <laughs> thank you set tell us who you are um hi i'm danae i'm the founder of vala we're yeah. a legal tech platform for workers um, my question is about impact investment and the the state of the investment market overall. I'm a VC backed company. I've you know seen other impact investors. I think the stat that I saw showed that it roughly halved this year compared to like the normal as it was from there. I mean, do you think that's just because of the wider trend, or um, just where do you think impact is, investing is going to be going as investment in general is starting to dry up? Great. Okay. Thank you. And so Daniel's going to pick that up in his very pithy final remark on the future of where social investment's going. Uh, anyone else want to come in? No, before I come back to the panel, feel free. No. Okay. Anna, I'm going to um, ask you to sort of give give us your based on all the work you've done on technology and how it plays out in the workforce, how it can be done well and badly by employers. What give us your kind of to, to sort of finish, give us your pitch about what you'd most like to see. What What's the sort of practice that you would like to see in the sectors that you've looked at, logistics, retail, and so on? What would you like to see employers being willing to do to make sure that AI is the force, that, a, a relatively benign force, rather than the more malignant sort that we worry about? What are the sort of things that should be tried out? Hmm. Um, I could answer that in, on different, on different, and uh, different uh, levels. I think that the um, probably the most important thing, luckily, is there's been uh, the the sur one of the surveys that I mentioned is provided in a way a business case for that. Mm -hmm. So it's about participation. It's about re real, real participation, um, and new methods, forums, and infrastructure um, to uh, to make that happen, which is so important in the tech. Um, and not just AI, but tech debate at the moment, because it's just not there. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the most important thing. And the survey did find, by the way, so the uh, with Warwick Business School, um, I suppose that, not by the way at all, um, it was one of the most important findings that high involvement practices um, was a way of mediating perceptions and incentives in a way that was closely correlated with better outcomes in terms of good job creation and work quality. Now that's really, really important. Um, so uh, collaborative infrastructure and participation. Um, I also can't help but also chuck in um, uh, you know, good work is a cross-cutting practice and policy objective. So right the way through the tech life cycle, and that'll be a way of pulling together the things and having the joined up um, thinking that um, Paul, um, you know, identifies as so important and we just haven't been able to pull off having, um, um, and also practice. So sandboxing, so something that can be done both by responsible employers and investors now, um, but could work and inform uh, the development of both policy and regulation if done really well. So um, watch this space. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, Danielle, for you, uh, give us, if we're having this, we're reconvening in five years' time. Uh, we've invested in another 50 wonderful ventures, huge impact, uh, and so on. But give us a sense of where you think the social investment space sh could be, should be, might be, depending on and what, and what will help it get it to its best possible place. Mm -hmm. Uh, particularly in relation to the world of work, but just more generally, like where is it headed and what can we do? Yeah, and I should I should touch on on your by 
by chance this morning I got a, a report from Wilson uh, Sonsini. Uh, they're a firm of lawyers. You will know them in, in the tax space. For those that don't, and I, I was one, um, they, uh, they did the original legal work on uh, Google and Twitter, uh, and uh, they got paid, instead of cash, they got paid in stock. Uh, uh, on the on the founding documents for those companies, I think you know lawyers make a lot of money. I think they really really made a lot of money. Um, but they they do the. I, I was just looking at their uh, their their update on the sector, uh, and it's like it's uh, it, it's cratered. Uh, it's essentially um, stock markets were uh, were doing well. Uh, investors made historically high commitments to funds. Uh, markets have tanked a bit. They're struggling to make their uh, commitments on their uh, on their previous funds. Uh, so uh, across the ball, uh, there is a real shortage of, uh, of investors um, out there. So it's tough. It's always been tough, uh, and it's just particularly tough um, right right now. Um, for so, what can we do to get more money um, into this uh, into this space? Um, I think the first thing I would say is um, uh, something that one of our senior Tai Chi teachers told me uh, in a class, he was explaining uh, some meditation that we were doing. Uh, he's from New York and he's a builder. Uh, he's also extraordinary at Tai Chi. And he was going on this long thing about Chinese philosophy. And then he sighed and he said, basically, don't be a dick. And you can imagine that in a New York um, accent, it works really, really well. Uh, but part of what we can do is stop discriminating in the investment marketplace. Um, good news for women, um, private equity and venture capital investment has doubled from 2% to 4%. Uh, it's just so just don't be a dick is like the good, a really good start to this. And uh, invest uh, on a more equal basis is a very good start. I think the second thing is there is nothing like a bit of the legitimizing stamp of government to help money flow and give investors a bit of certainty. So I would say two things, um, copy America, because that's always easy, and copy France, which is extremely difficult, even though it's 22 miles away rather than 3,000. So the thing to copy from America is long, I'm sure everybody asked for this absolutely everywhere, but it's please give us long, stable, consistent policy support for social investment. Even the British Business Bank's guarantee scheme switches on and off. Mm -hmm. It's the major intervention to guarantee small business lending, and it stops and it starts. It's absolutely dreadful. So long, consistent, stable policy, number one big ask. And that's what they have in America around social investment. The second bit, copy the French, um, which, is, which is tough for us, 100 years war and everything like that. But in, in France, they have the 90-10 the structure, um, Fund Solidaire. Uh, so what they said is, if you are a business with more than 50 employees, of course, you, you must offer pension options. All they said in France is, one of those options must be a 90-10 fund. 90% invested in responsible investment, mainstream markets, but 10 in the solidarity economy, um, which in France includes uh, workers' co-ops, as well as what we consider the social economy and the charitable sector here. 13 billion euros is now in those solidarity funds. 400 million or more euros gone into the solidarity economy. Um, it's absolutely extraordinary. That took time. Probably 15 years of that legislation has come into place. But those kind of little tweaks can really help private sector money flow into the, the social enterprise sector. And, and with choice, because there was no compulsion to choose a 90-10 fund. It's just when people have a choice to do social good, actually, they really often choose to do just that. Thank you, Daniel. Um, brilliant. Um, sounds like a fascinating Tai Chi. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, have to ask about that. Uh, Paul, uh, follow that. Um, if, if that was the kind of where social investment should be going, give us a, send us on our way with a where we should be hoping, expecting policy to take us and where a social change organisation can play, you know, can get us to in five years' time. Um, gosh, well, and I've never done Tai Chi, so I feel a, a, a huge disadvantage. I mean, I think just um, a, cu a couple of thought of re reasons to be cheerful in a way, and I don't quite know where we'll be in five years' time. I rarely know where we'll be in like five minutes, but um, 
one thing is um, levels of ingenuity and levels of risk appetite. I think we, we always risk underestimating both of those things. I mean, I suspect within this room there is a ton of ingenuity around the sort of issues that you've been talking about today. And whilst, you know, it, it, overall rates of investment go up and down, and I fully agree with the don't be a dick, I mean, ju just, uh, just on the point about diversity of investments um, alongside gender, I mean, it, uh, you know, th those, uh, those who are looking to set up ventures who, have, who come with black heritage or people of colour, they are an even bigger disadvantage, actually, when it comes to accessing social investment. One of the things JRF is investing in at the moment is a new fund for exactly that um, purpose. Um, so there is there is ample opportunity to um, to invest in new ways, um, and actually, you know, we as a foundation, we are not alone in in looking to invest more in the social impact space and impact investment space, and we are not alone actually in saying we are deliberately ramping up our risk appetite. So one of the six principles underpinning our um, our new strategy is sort of take more risk, um, which is you know having been a civil servant for twenty years is uh, you know deeply uncomfortable, um, but I'm but I'm doing my best. So so I think you know th that's a reason to be cheerful in the ingenuity space. There's there's lots of things we don't know how to sort yet and solve yet, but there's lots of people trying, and there's actually I think there is investment available there for for um, uh, for some of those um, ventures. But, but actually, weirdly, the other reason I think that's cheap, some of this doesn't require ingenuity. Some of these are actually old problems that we've we've tackled before and sorted before, and that's why I slightly boringly come back to you know sometimes legislation is the answer. Um, you know, uh, look at statutory sick pay is a really good example. Stat statutory sick pay in this country is so bad; it's a reason to be cheerful because it can really only go in one direction from here. You know, if the re effective replacement rate is about eleven percent or something, and I think in the OECD it's sort of sixty plus. When when your when your statutory sick pay is that crap. OK, it's going to go in one direction only, I think, you know, if government takes action. So, you know, to some to some degree, we don't need to be world beating in these areas. We just need to be a little bit better than crap, which is where we are. And so that's a really weird way of being cheerful. But it, it's one of the reasons why, you know, when I look at a lot of policy areas, and this is one, I do feel we're at a sort of turning point. You know, there is a breakdown in the current social and economic contract to a large degree. That's a sort of terrifying thing at one level. But it also fills me with quite a lot of hope about what the next 5, 10, 20 years bring in the policy making space because you know I, I do have a sense that things things have kind of got to get better in some of these some of these areas yeah there's certainly time for uh, a bit of progress um uh, we have overrun uh, but i think they were three fantastic uh, speakers so i'm deeply indebted to them um let me just say to the audience it's been a fantastic audience too we're gonna louise is gonna rightly have the the final words because this is her uh, thing more than anyone's um but just say from the resolution foundation for me uh i i really enjoyed the conversation and the nature of the conversation and the open ideas and the open way that our speakers and the audience have have sort of taken part today so thanks to all of you from me uh let's show our appreciation to our speakers in the normal way uh, and we'll get, we're going to leave the stage and uh we're going to leave it to Louise to wrap things up. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin, um, and thank you for the panel for enduring the heat and for such thoughtful contributions. Thank you all for coming today and, and for staying. It's been really lovely to have this group of, I've said to a few people, it's a room full of problem solvers. Um, we have acknowledged that there's lots of challenges, but we're also this has been such a, an amazing day of people with lots of ideas and exchanging um, information with other people about how to best to go out solving those ideas. I think we the, the the topic from that panel which really resonates is that we need lots of different approaches to solve these problems. We need many different tools in the toolbox and we've talked a bit about there about the role of policy, we've talked at different points about the role of unions and we know that the innovation is really important to this but we don't solve any of these problems alone, they need multi, multiple actors. When I look at work attack, I come back quite often to an example that's in um, James Plunkett's book and um, state about how the two-day weekend was implemented. When it was the norm to have one day off a week and work six days, at some point there was a shift to we need to have two days off, not one. And that came about through a mixture of really progressive employers who wanted to offer something different, a lot of them with a Quaker background, Joseph Rowntree being one of them. Um, it came about from politicians noticing this and putting in place legislation and from civil society groups saying, actually, this is what we want. Workers saying, this is what we need. We need more rest. So these time changes don't come about by one piece of the puzzle acting alone. 
they always come about with multiple stakeholders moving all the things together. So I really hope that we can spark some of that here today. I hope you've made some connections. I hope you've exchanged contact details with people. If you've missed out on doing that, please let us know and we will glue people together. Um, and I hope that you'll, you'll give us your thoughts on, on today and, and where work at should go next. We are always open to feedback. Please send it to us. And if you want to spend time with the team, we've always got a link on the website to book time in to speak to myself or to Emma. We would really love to involve you in the next phase. We are planning to continue this work and to build a larger worker tech fund to keep investing in this space. So if you want to be involved in that, please let us know in any capacity. I do want to thank again our funders who have been such a big part of delivering today, as well as the whole of the three-year programme, Accenture, Joseph Rantry Foundation, Friends Provident Foundation, Trust for London, and the UFI Voctech Trust. And also to Bethnal Green Ventures, who have helped us to back many of the ventures in the room today and who are now open for applications again for the next spring cohort so if you've maybe got an idea or maybe you've developed an idea in the conversation here today please go and look at the Bethnal Green Ventures website and uh, put in an application to, to get support to develop your idea. Um, and a final thank you to all of the Resolution Foundation team but especially to Emma my right-hand woman on all things ventures, and also to Tara for masterminding all of the comms, including the technical challenges that we've had. Please join us for drinks outside and um, please stay in touch. I hope you've had a great day.